Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Five One Speedway Show. Hopefully, you enjoyed la- the last episode on this. It was with the two-time world champion Bruce Penhall, and it was very interesting to hear what he had to say about a his racing and also what he's up to and his business and everything. It is a must must watch and listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Tonight, my guest is the current USA team manager. He is also a legend in the Cradley area again. So that's two Cradley riders in a row we've had on the show. Uh, he's also ridden for, for Bradford and Kings Lynn amongst other things he's won he's been part of World Team Cups and many many victories with Cradley and also lifting the League Championship and the Coe Cup please welcome my guest tonight Lance King Hi how you doing? Pretty good mate pretty good not bad for an intro <laughs> Yeah yeah it's, uh, that's a long time ago my goodness <laughs> Yeah it's even before my time which is even more scary so <laughs> but, uh, how are you keeping anyway? Uh, you know we're, we're doing good I, I, I'm healthy um, that's, that's probably the main thing right now with, uh, with COVID and everything that's going on in the world. Mm. Uh, you know, work's been, been really tough, but for, as it is for a lot of other people, but you know, the, the main thing is, is that I'm healthy and, and, and I, I can't complain. So. Oh, that's good to hear. Have you been affected at all with, with COVID at all, or is it everyone in your family been all good and safe? Um, knock on wood. Uh, everybody's been, been good. Mm. I think uh, everybody's been pretty smart about sort of where they're going, what they're doing, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, to, to not get political and everybody believes in masks or not masks mm. or whatever it is. But, you know, uh, we've been just sort of been been sensible and 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 like I say, maybe lucky. I don't know. But but everybody's been healthy. Everybody's been good. Well, that's good to hear because you know, as long as you keep them healthy and doing what you think's right at the end of the day, you know, there's no yeah. seems to be no seems to be like no right or wrong answer at the moment with a lot of things. But uh, good to hear you're safe, mate. That's the main thing. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's all good then. Well, so the main reason we're here tonight is to talk about your illustrious career. You know, uh, being part of the American team, Cradley, Bradford, Kingsland, and everything else in between. I think. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever questions you want to ask, fire away. So basically, the first one is how did you get in, how did you get sucked into riding speedway? Then how did I get sucked into riding speedway? Well, believe it or not, uh, my dad had a a motorcycle business mm-hmm. where they rented. They, he was managing a, a a company called uh, what what was it called again? Oh, I can't, it's at the tip of my tongue. But anyway, they rented motorcycles, and uh, Mike Bast. Mm. which was, you know, multi-time national champion, you know, one of the, obviously one of the, the legends in American Speedway. He was working for my dad uh, as a mechanic and in between, while he was riding Speedway. So my dad at times would go and help him at the track. My dad also was a fabricator and building engines and doing a bunch of things. And one day Mike's like, Hey, you know what? Um, you should build a junior speedway bike. And my dad and and Mike thought about it. And my dad ended up building a junior speedway bike. And that's how I got into the sport with Mike sort of training me and that kind of stuff. So, and he was one of the people that started junior speedway in the, in the United States. Yeah, because I had, um, I think it was Steve Machuro on like, in a very early pod- a podcast and show. Um, and he said that uh, it was you and your dad and everyone who basically helped him start in juniors and uh, a bunch of other kids as well. So, I mean, it must have been good to have a lot of riders who you eventually went to ride with and against through the 80s and things like that. You know, you must feel a bit of pride that, okay, thanks to my dad that you know, these these guys managed to get rides. Yeah, it's crazy, you know. Uh, I mean, I've been, I was out of the sport for a long time after I retired, mm. but as far as like junior speedway, if you look at the, the, the riders that were riding junior speedway, when I was riding junior speedway and how many of them came out of that, not only did very well in the United States, but also went to Europe and, you know, both Moran, Segalas, Pinhall, mm. uh, Steve Lucero. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so obviously that junior speedway program works, right? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, it was a, it was, it was a great time to, to, to be in junior speedway, to be in that era, uh, you know, in, in the riders that I rode against and grew up with. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar thing with uh, probably the likes of Billy Hamill, Greg Hankel, and next generation after you guys. You know, yeah. it was then all those sort of boys came over to Europe and competed and everything else. You know, and even when you went back to the states, you still rode against boys who didn't come over. Come over, you grew up riding with. So, you know, either side of the pond, it was tough. Yeah, I think that I think the next generation was like Josh Larson and mm. Ronnie Corey, and I mean, and Greg and Billy, and the, and I can't remember anymore, but. <laughs> But the list goes on and on. I mean, it's 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 pretty remarkable mm. um, how small our program is and was over here, but the percentage that that actually made a career out of it was pretty 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 incredible. Yeah, yeah, because obviously you managed to field, like I say, from a European point of view, you managed to field test teams and things like that, you know, and it wasn't, okay, maybe if, like, for example, in your your time, if Kelly couldn't come over, you could bring over an unknown American or someone like that, you know, who could take his place and, you know, just things like that. You had a little, had a good conveyor belt of riders coming through because obviously you had uh, also like lots of Robert Fetzing and uh, people like that were coming over as well. Yeah, I mean, th- there was, at that time, you could ride, I think, five or six times a week. Mm here in the States and actually make a pretty, pretty decent living. And, and, and that, I think that's the key to get to, for, for that carrot, for that, for that, to make a living out of this, out of riding speedway mm. that creates talent because the more people that get involved, the harder the, the racing is and you're only as good as the people you ride against. And unfortunately, you know, not stepping too far ahead, but, right now in, in, in our sport here, it's just, uh, you know, like an amateur sport Mm. and it's tough to get people to commit and spend the money when they're not making money and, and that kind of stuff. But, but anyway, yeah, I was fortunate that you could make a living out of it. And, um, you know, I had some incredible riders to ride against in the States Mm. to get better. Yeah, and also the different tracks and everything. Like I said up to probably six times a week. I mean, obviously having had Bruce on the show, I've had Sean McConnell on the show, and say I've had Steve Lashira on the on the show and things like that. And they've all said that riding five up to about five or six times a week helped them in their early days tremendously. So much track time, and also not just from scratch races, but handicap, you know, and things like that. I know Bruce from the last show was was very very critical, saying that that really helped him when he came over to Europe. Was that your sort of forte then, riding handicap, or were you more like a scratch person than back in those days? Oh, you know, handicap racing, there's no doubt about it. It made you a better rider mm. because any time that you had success in racing handicap, then they would handicap you more Yeah, and you put you farther back and farther. And then all of a sudden, instead of passing three people, now you have to pass four. Mm. And then, you know, obviously in our late, when, when we were at that level, we were, pa- we had to pass half the field. <laughs> at least to even transfer into the next race. Mm. So, you know, that, that makes you pretty hungry because if you don't transfer out of that, yes, you still have the scratch program, but the money, you know, I'm obviously you need to, to, to pass those people and, and, and it, and it forces you to maybe not just be a great starter. Yeah. You know, I, I mean that, I think that's one of the, the, the things that I have, in my, in my tool bag. And a lot of the Americans is the, the, the the art of passing or, Mm. or that determination of if you miss the start, you know what, it's not over. Mm. Uh, And I think a lot, a lot of that is down to handicap racing by far. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the footage I've seen, of course, a lot of it is still limited from the eighties and things like that. And I've got on DVD from, like I say, the test matches, even the Crayley matches. You see yourself passing people. You see yourself like like John Cook, Siggy, you know, uh, Bobby Schwartz, even making a few passes, which is a oh, that's a bit of a rarity sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it just shows it all. Those, all, all you guys. I mean, I've got limited footage from the states in the eighties, and obviously, even the the racing was was brutal. You know, to watch. You know, it was great to watch. Yeah, and and they and they made the tracks, uh, so you so it made it possible to pass. Mm. It wasn't just dry and slick. Yeah, we had those every once in a while, but a lot of times they had a lot of dirt on the outside, and there was there was multiple lines. So you know you had that opportunity if you had that talent to to pass. Yeah, the talent and also the confidence to pass those sort of people, you know, especially on the tight technical tracks that you have over there, you know, and things like that. But, you know, I've seen photos of yourself, 
Kelly, Dennis, John Cook, all covered in shale because the tracks just look just look so deep. You know, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're so much fun to ride. That must I say that must have been the huge buzz. Then we're just just racing, racing, and racing. Yeah, and I and I think that going to when we rode in Europe, mm. anytime the tracks got really deep, I think that's we shined as well because we were used to that used to that in the states of the, you know just looking for that traction and and when it was deep it didn't scare us at all you know that that we actually were hoping for that every time we went to the track yeah yeah it's better than riding a, a slick sort of track and of course if you get someone like like bradford over here which had a bit of dirt on it i mean geez that must have been a, a hell of a nice ride to ride around there yeah I, I, and that that's one of the one of the reasons why i decided to sign there Mm -hmm. is is it's it's not a hundred percent out of the start yeah. which we all know that i wasn't the best starter in the world so that that actually appealed to me yeah well that, that's good because obviously also now with bradford coming back you know it's great for british speedway anyway but i mean it must when you see that sort of thing on facebook or wherever you know you think that's not that's one track i used to love going to is Bradford coming back? Yeah, Bradford's coming back. I don't know if you I don't know if you know about it, but yeah, they, I didn't know that. But they're not coming back to Speedway this coming season. If we if we run it, it's going to be twenty twenty two. If Speedway comes back, they've oh, currently, that's very they, they've they've currently um, put in the stock cars uh, wall and everything in at the moment because they're going to run stock cars there for a year on shale, um, and then hopefully they want they want the Speedway there. So hopefully we can get a get a promoter or some description to go back in there. So. You know, it won't be the same as the old Bradford because what they've done, they haven't got the pits there. They've got a great big VIP suite on the third and fourth bend now. You know, so it's a bit, I don't think it'd be as, as wide as it used to be, but it still have the banking and everything else like it used to have. Yeah. And, you know, they can't narrow it up too much, especially if they're running the stock cars. No. Um, you know, and that's what made the old Bellevue such a great racetrack. It just, you know, one, it was wide, but it was fast. And mm. there's just, there's so many different lines around that racetrack mm. and, and the availability to pass when they had some banking. And um, I, that's great news. I did not know that Bradford's going oh, okay. back. That's great news. Oh, God. I'm glad to give, give you a, a news flash. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's good, good news. Yeah. But um, so to go back to, again, looking at your, sorry, your career, your juniors, um, I've got down that you managed to win the national junior championship a few times. You managed to win it, I think it was four times in the uh, mid to late seventies. Do you have many memories of the, those sort of meetings back in your early days? Yeah, I do. And it's funny that you mentioned Steve Lucero was mm. on your show because uh, I, I lived in LA at first and we were racing in LA and then we moved up to Northern California and that's where um, Steve lived. So me and Steve used to battle it out uh, every week. And, you know, I think our parents hated each other. And so then that obviously filtered down to us and we rode, our, you know, pretty hard against each other. And I've talked about this with Steve, you know, over the years, since we're adults about how silly it was and, and all of that, but, but it just made us better riders. And it was, it was a blast. It, it, it really was. Yeah. A nice little friendly rivalry. You know, it's good to have at that sort of age, you know, cause you want to get one over the other one each week and things like that and prove you're the best. But I think you must've come out more at the top of the juniors cause you won the nationals four times. I don't think he, I don't think he did at all. I, don't, I can't remember anyway from the show. Yeah. You know, we had, a, we had a pretty good run. A, yeah. and i had some i had some good machinery too which helped out but yeah it was, it was a good run got some secret weapons in <laughs> <laughs> well when my dad's making the bikes you know that that helps a little bit yeah yeah a little slight advantage but yeah. uh yeah so i mean it's good to hear because obviously again it's again the, these little stories are great to hear for us because we, we don't get to hear them you know we don't we don't mm -hmm. know what the, the rivalry was sort of like in the old junior days and things like that so but uh but how, when did you move up to the 500 then was it uh, a couple of years after the, your last win then well what's interesting about that is we're still on the luceros mm -hmm. um uh, I was asked by the promoters to start the season when I turned 16, mm. but I didn't turn 16 till August. So let's just say that we had like um, a fake birth certificate. And <laughs> so we got a license when we shouldn't have Yeah, and about a month. And a, I think it was about a month and a half or two months into the season. Uh, Bob Lucero, Steve's dad turned us in. 
So I got a big fine and I had to obviously wait until it, I had a, two choices, one, a year suspension, mm-hmm. or I paid, I think it was like $1,500 and I got to race on my birthday, which was August 13th. Mm-hmm. So that was, so that's how, <laughs> that's how my, my speedway career started. A uh, nice bit of culture. I, I mean, I don't blame way. them, you know, I don't blame them because Steve was on the sidelines mm-hmm. And they knew that we were pretty much the same age and they're probably thinking, why is he riding? And when I, I know my son isn't old enough. So <laughs> Yeah, well, it's any way to get any way to get a bike. But again, an edge, you get an edge on someone. Right. <laughs> right. And then and then obviously the the promoters that wanted me to ride, they knew nothing about it. They're like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. Yeah, because according to your license, this is this is you are sixteen. You know, right. you, you can ride. <laughs> doesn't doesn't mean you've got two birthdays. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, do you remember much of those sort of early days of being on the five hundred then and racing against these guys? Um, yeah, actually, when I jumped on a five hundred, it 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 handled worse than my junior speedway bike did. Mm-hmm. So I had to adapt to I, it. Just didn't handle as good, and and uh, and all of that. But, um, you know, it was tough. Uh, it just, the, the field was so stacked. I mean, there was some incredible riders in the States. And I remember we used to have a, a, a tape that we used to have to call in. I don't know if Steve and, and Sean said this, but there was a number that you had to call in to see if you even made the program. Mm-hmm. So what they would do is you would get this recording saying, you know, X, Y, Z, Friday night, uh, numbers, and you would have to wait for your number to be called to know if you even would even go to the track. And if you were on the program, that's how many good riders there were. Yeah. So not only was it important that you qualified for the semifinals and the main event through your handicap racing is if you didn't, you might not even be on the program next week. Yeah, it was. There were that many people on the sidelines waiting to to uh, to ride, yeah. and so even getting a scratch ride because there was only sixteen riders that got a scratch ride each night. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, just because you were on the program didn't mean you even had a scratch ride. So that you know that was, I mean, you know, it, it, that much more motivation to 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 try to do better mm. to even ride next week. You know. Yeah, it's also about having that carrot at an early age dangled in front of you. You've got, you've got to impress, you know, which obviously then would late, later on in your, your speedway career would stand you in good stead to impress promoters, managers, whoever, or sponsors in the future sort of thing. But Sean did mention that it was tough to come on to the program. He, and I think he said that he had to wait a couple of weeks to go to like, I don't know, like Costa Mesa or even yeah. like San Bernardino, you know, stuff like that. He had one meeting that would like be like two or three weeks later because he couldn't get in, you know, and you think that must have been compared to obviously I look at it now, obviously it's a lot different now, but the less riders you have now compared to what you had in your day, you know, it proves how much has changed in such a, in a long period of time, really. Right. And, and, you know, and, and like I said, the, the better the riders, you know, the better you get, I'm a firm believer of, you know, you could be winning every week, mm. but if you don't have anybody better than you, then, then how do you get better? I yeah. think it's pretty much impossible. That's why when I first came over, the British League was obviously the place to ride. And if you were going to be anything in World Speedway, you had to race in the British League Mm. because, you know, the best in in the world rode there. Yeah, and obviously the opportunities, I I can imagine at one point you must have had quite a few promoters knocking on your door or on the phone sort of saying, come to us, come to us, we can give you this, we can give you that, you know, that sort of thing. But did a certain Mr. Pennell then sway you to go to Cradley then in the end, or was it a case of you just want felt like going to Cradley? Um, yeah, basically, you know, it's weird. When I was riding, I I didn't know anything about England. I didn't mm. know anything about Europe. I knew that I knew that Bobby left and Bruce left and Siggy left and all these people went to Europe. But I I was like in my own little world, just racing speedway in the States. And then uh, I was sort of Bruce's protege for a year or so. You know, when he went to Europe, he passed on some of his sponsors to me. Mm. And uh, because I was Mike Bast as when I was younger, I was sort of his protege. And then Bruce took me under his wing a little bit. 
Yeah. And then Bruce asked me when I think I went, I think halfway or towards the end of my, my first year of racing when I was 16. Mm. And he said, Hey, uh, would you be interested in riding in Europe? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, sure. And he said, he goes, well, what about if, uh, if we bring you over here, you could check it out. You could stay at my house, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I was like, well, yeah, I've never been anywhere, but you know, in the United States. And uh, so that's sort of how that happened. They brought me over and I stayed at Bruce's house. And um, that leads me into my, like my first, my first day or my first sighting at Cradley. Mm -hmm. I remember I was in Bruce's van and we're driving in the front gate and there's all these people and he can't get through and <laughs> you know and i'm just like wow i've never seen anything like this mm -hmm. i mean you know when you drive to the the pits in america there's nobody there <laughs> but people that are riding yeah and then you know fans trickle in when it's time to start so it would just it just blew me away i've never seen anything like it and then obviously we couldn't get out of the van hardly and I didn't know that they told, you know, or put in the paper or the, the, the program that I was coming mm -hmm. and, you know, people are wanting my autograph and I'm thinking, what do you, you don't even know me. Like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, this is crazy. Yeah. So finally got into the pits and I'm just this starstruck kid, just like, you gotta be kidding me. Right. And then watching Bruce and watching everybody and the tracks were huge you know, or, or Cradley was huge. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, wow. Cause we raced on such small tracks, even though we had Ascot, which, which was a big track. Yeah. And I liked the bigger tracks anyway. So then I was going to ride after the meeting. And, uh, and so, you know, as the meeting got later and later in the meeting, I'm like getting more and more nervous. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't really know if I want to ride, you know? Yeah. So then that's when they had the second half and everything. Mm -hmm. So Bruce is like Bruce and, and Mike, Mikey is mechanic are like, Hey, you know, you better go get ready. So I go in the changing rooms and I get ready and I come out and it was probably, I think the second half final or whatever that was back in the day when I came out and they had the final and all of that. And then I'm in the pits and, you know, Bruce is talking to me and, if I'm, you know, telling me what to do and all of that. And I, I remember glancing out there when I was almost ready to go. And like, it looked like no one left the stadium. And I was like, like, what the hell is going on? And I asked, I remember saying to Bruce, like, what, what's, what's going on? And he's like, oh, they're waiting to watch you ride. And I'm like, you know, what? there's these thousands of people just waiting to watch me ride. He's like, oh yeah, it's a little different here. I was scared shitless. <laughs> How like, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me, right? Um, so I, I remember going out and riding, and after a couple of laps, I you know st stopped thinking about who was there, and it, the track was just lit up. And that's the difference too of ours is the whole stadium sort of lit up mm -hmm. at Crazy. Just the track was lit up, and and you know you're like obviously the spotlight, yeah, like a performer, you know, mm. and. Uh, and that was my, and that, and, and then I remember doing my, I don't know how many laps I did, came off, went in the changing rooms, got changed, came out and like, they like waited for me. I don't know, hundreds of them <laughs> for my autograph. And I was and so anyway, got through all of that. And on the way home, Bruce is like, so what do you think? I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. What do you mean? What do I think? This is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. And, oh, my God, you know, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. So that was my first experience. And obviously, like, where do I sign? Yeah. And yeah. Bruce, Bruce put together the contract, which I look back at it now, and it was the worst. I mean, <laughs> it was the worst contract I've ever. I, I mean, I barely had enough money to put food in my mouth. And I, I, we joke about it now, but, like, it was but it didn't matter to me. I, it wasn't about the money. The, the experience that I had was like, it was just the most amazing thing I've ever 
felt in my life. So then they said, uh, so then I, I went to a couple other races. I, th- I forget how long I was there. Mm-hmm. And the deal was, Hey, if you sign with us, we'll then bring you back the following year and to the world final at Wembley. Mm-hmm. So I came back um, just, and I mean, it, it put such a boost in my American program because I had something to strive for now. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw the racing there. I saw how incredible those guys were. And I'm like, I'm nowhere near ready for this. Mm. So I think that was smart on their part because they, rather than just bringing me over and all of a sudden I just start, I w- I sort of knew what I was getting into and it made me, you know, train harder and, and ride more and, and, and just test more and just everything. Right. Mm. Um, so then I came over and obviously watched Bruce win the world final, which was, you know, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Wembley in itself was probably the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Even to this day, the crowd, the atmosphere. And I've been to Cardiff. Yeah. It's close, but it's no Wembley, you know? Um, and then uh, the following year I came over and, and I was Bruce's partner. Yeah. I mean, that's great to hear. Cause obviously, you know, it's a huge eye opener for yourself. I mean, just saying that you had like a, a thousand or 2000 people still watching you ride in a, just a practice, you know, just to blow your mind away to give you some sort of idea of what it's like to ride over in here. And obviously I still wish those days were still here. Obviously, it's not like that now over here, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's also great to hear that you managed to get to Wembley, the last ever time at Wembley. F- fortunate that Bruce won it, you know, so it made it even more exciting for yourself, you know, things yeah. like that. Did you manage to get into the pits then at all? Was you in the stands watching? No, I was just in the stands. I was in the press box, which was amazing, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to have that that view. Uh, but, no, I, I, w- I wasn't in the pits. And, you know, nor did I really want to be. Okay. Because I, I didn't want to get in Bruce's way or mm-hmm. anybody's way. I mean, he's got a job to do. And um, I just wanted to just experience it. And, yeah. you know, I'll see you guys after mm. that kind of thing. Yeah, I can imagine a load of the American guys went there and had a huge celebration with Bruce. I can imagine, you know, yeah. great, for, great, for, great for American Speedway, great for Bruce, great for Crowley, great for everyone, really, because obviously at the time he was the people's champion. Yeah. And you know, it's, I've never, I've never said this anywhere before, but a part of me right at that moment was a little bummed. Okay. Because I wanted to be the the next American world champion. Uh, The first one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just for a minute, I was like, Oh, I wanted (laughs) to be that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then obviously so happy for Bruce. And then the following year he backs it up with another world championship Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I, I, I obviously wasn't ready yeah. to be that next world champion. Just, uh, that's just, that's been my whole, uh, my, ever since going to Cradley for that first time, mm. that just, that's all I ever wanted to be was world champion. Yeah. And that's what, what everything I did for the next so many years mm. was to be world champion. Yeah, and I mean, did you manage to get to the um, 82 World Final in LA? Did you manage to go back over and, and watch it? Um, I, I don't remember. I don't okay. think so. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I, I don't think I did go back. Mm. You know, I think I was, I was obviously at Cradley. Um, but yeah, I don't think I, I no, I, I definitely didn't go. No. No, I just wondered if you managed to get you managed to get a uh, last minute ticket or something like that to go out there and uh, and see it and everything. But I imagine it would have been great to eat, great to ride in that sort of uh, environment. I mean, fortunately for yourself, you, later on in the years you managed to ride in the World Team Cup at uh, Long Beach, so that was probably near enough to L, the, to the Coliseum is what you were going to get. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. I was um, I for our American final, we the the American final that we had at the Coliseum was basically to get it ready for the world championship. Yeah. And I went over for the American final. I was riding practice and then they said, Oh, and, and I forget who it was, but somebody said, Oh, and by the way, you can't ride the meeting. They pulled me out of the meeting after practice because they said that, um, I, and I forget what the, what the reasoning was, 
but I, I'm sorry, that was a year prior yeah. when they, when I wasn't 18. Mm. That's what it was. Well, I was 17 and they were doing like a trial run at the, the Coliseum for the following year world final. Yeah. So I rode practice and then they're like, Oh, well, even if you, even if you transferred, let's say you got f- top four, you couldn't ride the overseas final cause you weren't old enough. Mm-hmm. Cause back in those days you had to be 18 to have an international license. Yeah. So I never got, I, so I only practiced at the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. I never got to actually race the over there, the, uh, the American final. Mm-hmm. But still, to even get some just laps around, okay, it's a practice at the Coliseum. Yeah. It's still, I can imagine it's a huge arena. Because obviously, again, I've only seen videos. I've seen pictures of the Coliseum since. But, you know, just looking at that sort of gladiatorial sort of uh, arena, you know, things like that, I can imagine it was a great experience. Yeah, it was. A, I mean, it was, and it suited my style. And and we had some great engines. And I, and I mean, I, I don't know if it was worse that, Cause I was pretty quick that day mm. and I was like, Oh, you know, maybe I have a chance. <laughs> and, but then again, in the end, again, I've already been to England. I've already seen it mm. and I have a chance. And then the age thing cropped up on me again. <laughs> if I had my old license, <laughs> but I would have been able to. Yeah. Those damn Lashiro's again, they caught you out. That's what ruined it. <laughs> No, but it, again, it, it's great to hear this sort of thing because obviously, again, it's hearing your ambition, your your hunger, your drive to, to do it. I mean, um, unfortunately, you, you didn't quite get the number one step, but you still got world number three. But uh, we'll come on to that in, in a bit. But I've got a bit of um, footage from, I think it's your uh, early days in um, at Cradley you, I've got here. Um, it's it's uh, Ipswich. Um, I think it's yeah. It's, you're you're here in gate number two. I think it's like the, one of the first meetings of the year of eighty two. I think it is. Yeah, I think that I think that was my first meeting. Or yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, and I have something to say about this after. It's pretty funny. Oh, you, you could talk during it if you want to. You're more than welcome to you just just to say what you say. Oh, I got to <laughs> see if this is actually what I'm going to talk about, though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, was a fo- it looks like it was a foggy night at uh, Foxhall. You know, you you and yeah, Bruce. There was a few of those. I, I think I got fogged off there once. <laughs> yeah, it was, wouldn't surprise me. This was a few fog offs at Foxhall in the in the, in the uh, yeah. In the so years. so th- so this this goes into this goes into what I was talking about. How the tracks were really deep mm. and how they suited me. And I remember. I think it was the first three races. I mean, the first three meetings, maybe the first four meetings. I was top of the league averages at Cradley <laughs> and I beat Bruce like in almost 90% of the races. Mm-hmm. And I remember making a phone call to my dad going dad. Cause he's like, so what do you think? You know, how is it? I'm like, I- I'm killing it. <laughs> I- I'm like, I-, I can't believe it, but like, I'm killing it. Like dad, it's easy. This is easy. <laughs> I-, I don't know what I was worried about so bad. Mm. And so much like I, I beat Bruce almost every race. He's the world <laughs> champion. Well, that's because the tracks were so crazy deep. Yeah. Well, then the tracks got slick uh. and I couldn't buy a point. <laughs> um, and then, you know, going from this, Oh my goodness, this is so easy. Like what was I thinking to, getting my ass handed to me every race and going, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Like what happened? Mm. And then the, then the whole, you know, the, the, the starting technique and clutches and, and, and how engines are set up and mm. all of that played, played a part where when it's deep out of the start, it doesn't really matter. No, you know? Um, and I just, Oh, it put me in such a bad funk. Mm. because I'm, I went from top of our averages, killing it to like, am I going to be able to stay? I, oh, right. I stink that bad, you know? Yeah. And it didn't really matter if, if I, cause if I didn't make the start the the tracks were slick and you couldn't pass. Mm. So I was like, Oh no, like, like I'm, what am I going to do? So yeah, that was uh, I'll never forget that. Because <laughs> then my dad would call me. How's it going? Um, I got I got one point. 
I got, I got, I got two points. I got no points. And yeah. he's like, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, uh, dad, it's everything that they said it was going to be. I just wish I wouldn't have had those first meetings. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing with March. In March and April, you know, they're wet. You know, the tracks, they keep the moisture and everything on the track. But as soon as the summer comes, get a bit of hot weather on it. Especially if you do those Sunday afternoon meetings, they're bone dry, they're slick. You know, yeah. you, you, you're you going to struggle to score a point on them. I mean, um, my, my local club's Eastbourne. And of course, they back in the day, we used to run on Sunday afternoons and things like that. So I can imagine even coming down somewhere like Eastbourne, which is a tight technical track, you know, probably suited you in a way. Right, but, right. But, but having it as slick as a board didn't really suit you. Yeah, it suited me great if I made the start, mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, it just, uh, I just wish I never had those meetings up front yeah. because it, it did more harm than good mm. because I had, you know, this 18 year old attitude and, and <laughs> all of that. And, and it was, not, it was not good. No, but then again, you put it down to, uh, like I said, to most people, it's like, it's a learning experience, you know, and things like that. You go, okay, we know what to do next year when we come back, you know, sort of thing. But um, to hear that you were slightly worried, but you couldn't come back, because obviously back then it was the, I think it was the Sydney rule, the six point average. You had to keep your six point average to stay over for next year, sort of thing. But obviously you managed to do that and you came back in 83, you know, all guns blazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, um Again, I look back at it. It was it was the worst three or four meetings. I should I I shouldn't have had those. Mm. But then in the end, it just makes you better, right? Mm. Um, it, it just made me try that much harder, and 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 it, so I, it, you know, in the end, it was a good thing because I learned a whole lot about myself. Yeah, um, I learned a, a lot about the bikes and setups in a in a big way very quickly and try and uh, trying to adapt and mm. so but it, it's funny to look back at that now but at the time it was a nightmare yeah i can imagine just scratching your head thinking well why is this not going right what, what am i doing wrong you know and things like that but i can imagine when, when the wind when the, when the colder months came back sort of like august september you started flying again you must have done because the tracks would have been a bit grippier and things like that yeah and they, they were grippier and and i got better out of the starts and mm. on the slick stuff and and i just learned i learned it how to ride in England. I learned how to ride in Europe. I learned, uh, you know, different, different techniques and, you know, cause when it's really deep, it suited my, my style and everything mm. from, from back home. Yeah. Well, I needed to adapt and, and, and luckily I was, I was able to adapt and, and then when it got deep again, I can resort back to my old, my old, you know, United States um, days. <laughs> yeah, the hard aggression and the things like that yeah, and, yeah. and chasing the dirt sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but also in um, N82, you managed to win a bit of silverware, managed to lift the KO Cup, you know, um, in your first year. So that must have been uh, a great, great thing for yourself. Yeah, and that was one thing too that, that I never had, mm. meaning I've never was a team before. Yeah. It's always been 100% um, individual. Mm. So having that team and, 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 and again, when I said that I had that learning curve, it wasn't done by myself. I mm. mean, you know, Bruce helped me, obviously Eric Gunderson was, was, a, was a key person. I, I owe a lot of my success to Eric mm -hmm. for helping me not only at the track, but in the garage and yeah. set up. Um, and, you know, we were in, both in Tamworth. That's one of the reasons I moved to Tamworth mm. is because of Eddie Bull, my my uh, engine tuner, and Eric, um, Phil Collins, you know Andy Graham, not so much, but he's I mean he still helped. We and and that was one of the things that that I loved about Cradley, and didn't realize how much of a team we were until I left Cradley. Yeah, and rode for other clubs. And was like, wow, that was a special place, mm. a special people. Um, you know, we were, every team member was one second away from loaning you their bike or whatever it took for the team to win. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. And the, I owe the team a lot to help me in helping me progress through that first season. Definitely. And, and also, you know, when we won the cup and, and the, the league and all that. Mm. 
Yeah, because I always get the impression with Crowley they had um, a great nucleus of riders because obviously everybody got along with everybody. Unfortunately, the, the, the team managed to stay the same for, the, for a couple of years, you know, really with only a, really one or two changes to the team to fit in with the points limit. I mean, obviously you lost Bruce after the 82 World Final. You know, I mean, imagine that, that could have been a bit of a blow to yourself, you know, not having Bruce there. But probably by that sort of time, you were like, OK, I know what to do. I know what to expect. So it might have been a bit easy for yourself. Yeah, and you know, I, I think uh, at that at that time I was ready to take on being the popular American there. Yeah, or or what have you. He taught me so much, and and like I said, and the team did, and and also Cradley was Cradley was a team like the American team was. Mm. We were all friends. We were all there for each other. We there was nobody there for themselves. Mm. We were there. Obviously, you want to win for yourself, but at the end, it's the team's victory that matters. Yeah. Because if you're scoring a maximum every night and mm. the team's not winning, eh, you know, yeah, that's great individually, but 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 that's not what it's all about, you know. No, I, no. Love, I love the team. Yeah, the, the team racing is obviously great because again, I think, well, from my point of view, the, you guys as Americans have seem to be brought up as teammates. You know, in every sport, you know, you seem to you seem to just excel in the team sports no matter what. Yeah, and and anytime you put on that uh, American body color, mm. it just I don't know, it just you just rose up. I, I just felt like I, I personally excelled under stressful situations. All right excelled the bigger the meeting the more stress the more the more pressure the better i was mm. and i think that's a lot to do when i put that american body color on i wasn't just racing for myself i was racing for my country and my teammates especially when we were we were racing together and it just it, i think it made me better yeah, I mean, that's great to hear because obviously your results prove it, you know, through your career, you know, riding as uh, an American team and also an individual, you know, because um, obviously you managed to win the overseas final in, uh, I think it was 84 um, and, and things like that. So obviously great you know, on the individual front, you did pretty good for yourself. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it turned out pretty good. I missed the, the big one, mm, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm pretty proud of what I've done. Yeah, I mean, before we just go on to that 84 season, which is obviously a great year for yourself, you know, we had the the dominant year of 83 for Cradley, you know, where you swept the board, you know, with the, with the League and Cup double, you know, with I think only losing one or two meetings all season. I mean, that must have been great for yourself as a team, you know, just to go through for that long unbeaten, you know, and then these, these, these uh, uh, wave uh, clubs coming to the track and trying to say, oh, can we beat Cradley this week or how much are we going to lose by to Cradley this week? Right, you know, and... and uh... Um, what a great feeling, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think I think I won the Golden Hammer that year. Oh, okay. Right, which, which to me, the the open meetings in England were almost like world championship races. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, each each club had one. Mm-hmm. And when I won the Golden Hammer, I was just like, I, I mean, I truly felt, you know what? I, I've made it. Mm-hmm. I, I can ride with these guys. I can compete with these guys. And that was the first sign that I had that, that, you know what, I, I'm going to be able to mix it up with these guys and, and, and who knows what my future holds. But that was the first, the first time that I was like, wow, I think maybe I can, I got, I got a chance here. Yeah. And I mean, it just sometimes just takes the, that sort of meeting to sort of say, yes, I can mix it. Yes. But, and obviously that's also on the English tracks, but obviously when you go uh, to like Europe, to Germany or wherever like that, we go going to do the um, international rounds. It proves that you can, again, mix it with with those boys on those different types of tracks. Because obviously in 83, you managed to make the world final in Norden, you know, when uh, Egan Muller won it. You know, I mean, it must have been a huge experience for yourself to just even make the final. Oh, you know, it was. I mean, like, I, I couldn't even believe that, <laughs> that, I, that I made it. Mm. And also it was, that's where experience played a huge role. I had no one in my corner. Mm. It was my dad. My dad came over and uh, it was my dad, myself, and my mechanic in, in a place we've never been before, you know, the world championship Yeah, Uh, on a track, on a track that was, that was 150% different (laughs) in practice than it was race day. I mean, practice was a speedway track. 
race day was a long track. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it felt like a foot deep. <laughs> and obviously Egon was head and shoulders better than anybody that day. If it was dead, if it was a speedway track, there's no way I, he might've gotten maybe top 10. Yeah. That's my, that's my, my feeling. On the other side, I think I would have, I don't even know what I got that, that what I ended it up, mm. but everything that I chose was the wrong bike, <laughs> the wrong engine, the wrong gear. It was, it was horrible. Mm. I sucked so bad. And, and that's a track that, that I love long track mm. and I loved them deep mm. and I just wasn't ready for it. I, I, I remember going out for the parade going, ah, this is great. But I didn't even, I was so mesmerized with the world, the world final that I forgot. I didn't even think of, you just set your bike up for a speedway track. Mm. And I made no changes. I mean, none. Yeah. And I went out for my first race. So I was just like, Oh no, this is <laughs> horrific. And, and then it just took me too long to come around mm. towards the end of the, the meeting. I don't know what my, I forget what my, what I did, but I know that I know that I felt better and my bike was better and I switched bikes. And, but if I would have had somebody in my corner, I would have done that the morning of when we yeah. walked the track, I would have went, okay, shelf that bike put this bike in, put this gear on, you know, this tire, but I, the experience just absolutely killed me on that one. The lack of. Yeah. And I mean, obviously anything, I mean, your first world final, you know, just stepping out to a hu again, another huge arena at Norden, you know, full, fully, uh, full capacity, you know, it's, it's a huge thing to take in, you know, and of course, well, how old you been about 19? Was you about then? About that sort of time? Yeah. Yeah. I was, not, I was eight. I was eight. 19 yeah i was 19 yeah. yeah i mean even at that age you know to obviously a make the final and b to even just be sort of like in this huge arena you think i mean obviously yeah if you had someone in your corner maybe someone like bp or even bobby schwartz or someone like that you know we're taking a lot of pressure off your shoulders but still it might have been the case of that you got a few more points i think even i think you scored about four or five that day i think you did because um i think it was dennis dennis was the was the favorite to win it that year right, um, right. but obviously like you said the track was a bit deep you know, deeper than what everyone else probably thought it was going to be. But uh, did you, when was the practice then? Was it like a couple of days then before the final or was it the day before the final then? It was the day before the final. And, and it, and it was just a, it was a typical German speedway track, just flat out mm. and somewhat slick, you know, like they all were. And, and you had, it was so important to make the start, even though it was so big. Mm. And, uh, and like I said, on the day, it was just not even, it was not even close to the same track. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was pretty remarkable. I mean, it would have been great if they were planning corner or something, you know, that's what it, they just rototilled it up. Yeah. It's what we call over here, plowed field sort of thing, you know, that plowed field sort of thing where it is, uh, you know, uh, too deep and everything else, because it, it showed, I think it was, I think Egon got a maximum and then the next yeah. person was Billy yeah, Sanders end, who got 12. So, you know, yeah. The, yeah. The end result was exactly what they wanted. Mm. I mean, exactly. they wanted a German world champion and, and what they did to get it, it worked. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was, miles faster mm. miles faster and of course also he was riding the gm which was just breaking through at that time as well and things like that so maybe the the switch from was you and Westlake's at the time then that's yeah time. Westlake's. i think he had the he, that was the only gm available mm. i think but i mean i mean he has so much more long track experience mm. than anyone in that speedway field mm. that's that's not our specialty <laughs> or and i'm not speaking with for all the riders but pretty much Mm. And I mean, all the testing and everything that he's done on the long track, just no, none of us have that. No. And it, it was just, and, and, and that's where he shined. I mean, his, his look at his speedway bike. It looked like a long track bike <laughs> with his handlebars and all that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, and, and he just, I mean, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect for him. Yeah, and I mean, like I say, after that, after that meeting, again, it was probably concentrating on the league. And obviously, like I said, you dominated the league with the cup and cup and uh, league championship in the end. You know, I mean, it must have been, uh, I mean, 
okay, another positive year because you're on the stepping stone back up. You made the world final, you know, and obviously you're still dominating with Cradley. So they're moving on to sort of like 84. You thought maybe that, that this is your time to sort of like really sort of like push for maybe a top top half finish in the world final and maybe a top three. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. I never, I never, um, I never had goals of top five, top three. Mm, okay. uh, my goal was to be world champion. Mm. Um, and, and I'll, and I'll, when we get there, I'll tell a story, but my, my goal, my goal is world champion. That's, did I think that I could be world champion in 83? No, no. but you know what? That's I'm going there for, to do that. Anything's possible. You never know. Right. Yeah. I, I won the golden hammer that year. That's not possible, but somehow I did it. Mm. So anything's possible, right? Yeah. On the day. Look at Egon. That's not going to ever happen. That would have never happened again. <laughs> so, so going into 84, I obviously from where I started in 83 to what I ended in 83, mm. that was a, 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 a nice steady curve up. And my goal in 84 was now I, I, my bikes are way better than they were at the beginning of 83. So now I'm starting in 84 with those bikes. So, I mean, just everything in my, in my career in 83 got so much better Mm. and knowing that I'm starting at that level now. And if I keep that same curve, that same learning curve and progression, I mean, anything's possible, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So. But yeah, I mean, I mean, riding with obviously in '83 when you had Eric um, and Simon Wig, you know, um, Andy Graham, Phil Collins, you know, again that, that that sort of team pretty much stayed the same pretty much in '84. Apart from you lost Wiggy because obviously the average limit and things like that. But um, I can imagine you, you, as a team in '84, you must have felt confident defending the championship and things like that. Oh, we had and we had so much fun. Oh yeah, and, and that and that's one of the things too is is a lot of times racing is not that much fun, mm-hmm. uh, and we had a blast, and I and I do believe that that had a lot to do with our success as well. Yeah, um, the American team. Anytime we get together, we have a blast. Mm-hmm. Winning or losing, we're having fun because we're doing everything we can for each other. And that was the same way in that, that season with Cradley Mm. and, uh, and it just felt, it just fell into place. And I think a lot of it was because we were all good friends. We all had a blast. We made light of bad situations, which unfortunately we didn't have that many that year because, because the team was so dominant, but yeah, that was, that was some fun times. Yeah, yeah, and it's all about having fun, you know, in the day. Because obviously, then you're in the World Cup, World Team Cup squad, you're regular in the USA Test Series and things like that. So I can imagine, though, you you kept pretty busy then throughout the year, no matter what you were doing. Yeah, and that's the thing too is is you mentioned seat time earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, now that I I'm in four wheels and all of that, there is absolutely no substitute for seat time, mm. no substitute for laps, no substitute for racing. I don't care how much you practice and you test it's different racing. Yeah. So when you're, you know, we raced in, I mean, there wasn't one cup or one anything that we didn't race in. Mm -hmm. So as a team, we were racing more than any other team out there. Mm -hmm. So the more you're racing, the better you're getting, the more, the better that I was getting individually, I was having more open meetings on the continent it was, I mean, I think I had like 130 races Jeez. nights that year. Yeah. But you know what? It just makes you better, right? Yeah. You know, if you could stay healthy with it, with that whole, that whole time, which knock on wood, I did it, except for my knee, but I, mm. that was fine. Um, yeah. I mean, you just, you just get better. Yeah. And of course, again, like I said, mixing it with the big boys, the best boys in the world, you know, that's going to help you tenfold. And obviously I can imagine when you went back to America, those few times of like the American final, probably like one or two open meetings in the early in the year, you know, it probably it stood you boys out probably more, more than the rest sort of thing with like the local talent. Cause obviously riding the British league, you're sharp or you're faster and things like that. So I can imagine it was like, it was good to go home, but also good to beat these boys before you go over to England. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things that that American Speedway did, uh, the AMA, Mm -hmm. and it was due to the promoters. One is Harry Oxley, and he was the main driving force that he made a deal with the BSPA, I believe at that time, Mm. that if you want like Bruce Penhall, then you need to send him back three or four times during the year. Yeah. If you, that way he's not losing all of his superstars and he has no buddy, no, nothing for the fans to come and watch. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was pretty smart because every single week, he could advertise a new per a new American coming back from Europe. Mm -hmm. So it was perfect for him. (laughs) It was perfect for us because we got a paid trip home Mm -hmm. um, and a break to see our family, our friends have fun, all of that, and then go back to business in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it was great for him. Great for us because if we didn't have them putting that in that BSPA contract, or if we tried to negotiate it, it would have never happened. No. So it's beneficial on both sides. And I remember coming back to America and not any disrespect to the American riders, but I remember going as I was riding, going, Oh my, Oh my goodness, this is so easy. <laughs> like, like I am so much better mm-hmm. now than when I rode here mm-hmm. because all of those riders, again, you only get as good as the people you ride against. So they really never excelled. No, they've stayed, they've plateaued. And when I came back, I was just like, wow, Mm. I I couldn't believe how much better I was because in, in Europe, I was just as good or not as good as a lot of the top riders Mm. or, or the field is so stacked in Europe. And then coming home is the first time that I realized how much better that I got. And uh, that was, that was an eye opener. Yeah, because obviously, that, like I said, it just shows your progression in such a short space of time as well, you know, because obviously coming over fully full time in 82, going back in 83 and 84 and things like that, you know, it's only a couple of years, but you're still you're then all of a sudden head and shoulders above these other local lads, you know. But then again, again, going back to what we said earlier, they're chasing you, so they're getting that bit better because they're chasing someone faster, you know, things right, like right. that. Was there any sort of Americans around that time that you were surprised that didn't come over to this country? Um... Not really. I think the, I think, I, I think the, I think the best writers did. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think the best writers did. And, and I, and I think there were some, some that did come over mm. that probably shouldn't have, um, but they had to give it a shot. And I, I respect that. Mm. And, and, and there was, some, there was some that I think had more talent, but there was certain things in their life that pulled them away from being the best that they could have been. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's just life, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, obviously, if there's more lucrative things back at home, you know, why would you give that up for some for going over to a, a cold, wet European, you know, chase a possible dream, not a guaranteed dream, sort of thing, you know, unless you worked hard for it, like you did, you know, things like that, you know, because obviously, again, look at '84, you know, you had a good, I think you had a good run in the American final that year. I think you got like third in that maybe, um, mm-hmm. or fourth, and then you went on to the overseas final. Obviously, you went to Hyde Road, Bellevue, um, and the thing I remember seeing the video of that because I think I did a special on. Kenny Carter because obviously he had broken his leg that year and the whole media attention was on Kenny that year um, and that it was a dry Sunday afternoon but you managed to max out on a 15 point maximum it must have felt special to yourself yeah you know there's not too many there's not too many times in your career that you have those days that nothing goes wrong mm. that you can do no wrong I missed the start and it didn't matter it, yeah. it was just one of those days and I didn't know that as the day was going on, mm-hmm. I was starting to realize it, but like, it was just, I had a good engine. I had a good bike. I had a good setup. It was just one of those where the world's all aligned. And no matter what I did, whether I made a start, I didn't make a start. It was just easy. Everything yeah. was easy. And it's crazy to, to say that with that type of competition, but if it might've been the next day, or the day earlier, mm. things might be a lot different, but just that day, just everything just fell into place. It was a, it was a magical day. Definitely. Yeah. And obviously that was well, the- one of my favorite racetracks. I love, I've, 
always loved Bellevue. Yeah, I mean, from the, again, I only get to see videos of it. I never, obviously, it was way before my time and things like that. But the, the footage from it and everything, it's awesome to see Hyde Road, you know, big, fast, you know, sweeping corners. You you were, you were good if you could pass someone around there. You had the speed, but also you must have been shitting yourself a little bit because you were in front. Don't know where nobody's coming from. You can't protect the track inside or outside. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, a great day for yourself. A nice little gold trophy. You know, just a little small one there for mental peace, you know. <laughs> but um yeah, and I and I think um you were I think you were the first, maybe the first American to win the overseas final as well. I think because I don't think oh, Bruce I don't, I don't, maybe, think, I don't know. I don't think Bruce won. I think Bruce came close to it, but I don't think he ever won it. So so, so I think I think that's, that's one that's the first thing that I've outdone Bruce ever won. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is because I, I know, and I think it was like uh, 81. I think was the first year of the overseas final. Right? I'm putting my Anorak hat on now, yeah. um, and uh, I think Bruce just missed out with that one. And he missed out in '82, and then eight, um, I don't know who won it in '83, but obviously then I you won it. Know that. One in eighty four. So yeah, I'm pretty sure you are. I'm pretty sure you are. So but uh, there you go. Then you did the first. There you go. There's something <laughs> that I did. <laughs> that's that's like you're on your old Speedway CV now. I was the first person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, and obviously then I think it was in the Intercontinental Final. Um, then was that uh, was it Denmark? Was it Voyant? I think it was that. Yeah, that Voyant. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you also you played second in that meeting as well. So leading up to the final, you had a good road to the final. Yeah, everything, everything was great, and and you know, in those in the in the overseas final, in the American final, the Intercontinental final, I could, and this sounds horrible, but I could care less how I did. Oh, okay. I was just there to qualify. Mm. Again, my main thing was to win the world championship. I, I didn't go there, going. I'm gonna. I want to win this mm. if that sounds weird mm. I, I i i could care less i mean yes it was amazing winning the overseas final but uh that's that just got me through yeah um there's a bunch of pictures of us with uh we used to have these these the, i used to cut the arms off of my turtlenecks because mm. i didn't like them in my leathers yeah and we used to put them on our face and make masks and <laughs> And all of that, which there's a, there's a famous one with me, I think Mitch Shira, uh, my mechanic and Sean Moran in the pits at Voyance. And that was at halftime when yeah. we've already qualified for the world final. Like I could care less if I rode another race after halftime because mm. I did what I went there to do. Yeah. And that was to qualify. And we were having a blast. I mean, you, these pictures, they've been in Speedway star and all that. Yeah. And it's just, like, and I, I don't, I can't speak for them, but for me, I like, I, I've already done what I've come here to do, um, was to get me to the big stage. Mm. Yeah. So obviously fairly relaxed, no pressure. Yeah, and, then you, and then you end up doing really well. Right. Mm, Cause exactly. there's no pressure on you. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the night said you finished second in the, in the fight in that uh, in this continental final, you know, progressing on to, to Gothenburg. But I think before that, I think it was the World Team Cup was in between that as well, the final. I um, think so, yeah. Which was at uh, Lejno. Um, I think it was and, at and we, and we just got our butts handed to us. Oh, yeah. That was, that was a horrible, that was a horrible night for every single rider except for the Danes. They yeah. were, th- again, that night that I said about the overseas final, mm. that was a night that they had as a complete team. Yeah. There was nothing they could do wrong. That nothing. Mm. Every rider was a superstar. And I, I actually looked at that meeting a couple months ago, three or four months ago, and yeah. watched every race. And it was amazing how much they had every single rider covered. I, it was just, it was, like I said, they could do no wrong. No, exactly. I mean, I think there was a thing, because uh, obviously I think Dave Lanning did the commentary for that one as well. And he was saying about um, like Gunderson taking an age at the start line and things like that, because obviously bumping the tapes, you know, unsettling everybody towards the towards the first corner. But that sort of thing I relate to is like the old Ivan Major days when Ivan used to do it. He used to unsettle everyone. Again, it's a psychological sort of thing. But again, uh, there's no big, fast track, but ultra slick. So it's an opposite to a Lance King sort of track. No. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, and they even actually made some passes, which I mm. couldn't believe. Um, but yeah, they were just, they were, they were in a, a, 
in a league of their own that day. Uh, we weren't the only team that sucked. I think everybody did. We just we just had a bad one. Yeah, it was between sort of yourself, England and Poland for the minor places, really, after Denmark, probably after like six, seven races, were like, like 10, 12 points in front of it. You think, oh, okay, we're battling for silver here. I think they like got twice as many points as second place or something. It was so ridiculous. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. I think I think I don't think you're far off with that because I think Eric got a maximum. Hands only dropped yeah. one point or something stupid like that, you know. And it's like, yeah, you think that's never going to happen again, sort of thing, you know. And no. I mean, the, the closest yeah. nation nowadays is obviously Poland, but we don't have the World Team Cup anymore at the moment, so you know, it's never going to be sort of beaten. And of course, that was the year that was uh, very special to Eric because he did the, the three crowns, pretty much the long track the world team cup and the um world individual so yep. again good for crayley probably good for yourself to also look up to someone like that who's uh winning all these trophies and you think yeah that could be me one day yeah and you know eric deserved everything um there there at that point in time i don't think there was anybody that i knew personally that worked harder mm. on his craft on his bikes on everything. And, and like I said, I learned so much off of Eric, Mm -hmm. but I learned off of him. I wasn't him. Meaning that, that I, I, even though I saw what he did and how he prepared, I didn't see it all. Obviously he didn't share it all with me, but um, that guy wanted it. I think more than anybody that I knew. I obviously wasn't close to hands and a few others, but but I was close to Eric and, and, uh, and he deserved it hundred percent. Oh yeah. hundred percent. You can't take it away from him. I mean, yeah. myself, m- myself, I think he, I respect him for what he did and everything and everything I've seen of him riding, you know, he's only a little bloke, but he could put himself about what he wanted to, mm-hmm. you know, but, but also he was, I think Eric was good at the one night world finals. I don't th- I think he might've struggled a little bit in the Grand Prix. I think Hans was a better Grand Prix sort of style rider rather than, rather than Eric, but that's my own opinion. I mean, you might, might say different. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Mm. And going and saying that, and, and I don't, I don't toot my horn at all, but I think if they had the Grand Prix in the 84 years and all of that, I think I would have had a good chance of winning. Mm. Cause if you look at, at all of the, the rounds and all of the, the big meetings that year, and, and I don't know, I haven't done it, done this, but if you put like all of the standings together and the points together, uh, myself, Sean Moran, there's a few that were really, really consistent on all those big stages. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I wish we had the Grand Prix series back then because anything can happen on the one night, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, you know, one little mistake, and you're not world champion. And yeah. that's sort of what happened to me in 84, you know? Yeah, which nicely leads us on to talk about the 84 final. So, I mean, from your from your point of view, of it, how was the meeting for yourself? Was it? Did you think it was a good meeting? I mean, okay, you, you finished third in the world, but do you reckon you could have probably won the meeting? Yes. Um, I, I, thought, I thought it was a great meeting for me. One is, you know, uh, I, think, I think I was one of the only ones to pass. Yeah. Um, I got Carl Meyer at the line. Um, I, you know, obviously I was in a position to win the world championship against Eric. Yeah. Going into that race, I knew, ex- I, I knew if I missed a start, it, it was done. I mean, Eric's too fast w- when he gets the lead. Mm. I know that if I made the start, I pretty much had it won because I don't think that he would have passed me. I know how to cover that track. I cut to cover the track pretty well. The other two riders in that race, both myself and Eric approached them Mm. and said, Hey man, we're both myself and Lance are here to win the world championship. Can you stay out of this? And they both said, yeah, it's, it's totally up to you guys. We're not going to spoil this thing for you guys, Mm. whether they did or not. That's what they said they were going to. So I knew going into that, I only had to worry about Eric. Yeah. I knew I had to make something special out of the start. And if you watch that again, you'll see exactly what I'm saying. Mm. I knew I was never, I was never the guy that could guess a start. Yeah. 
my best starts were when I didn't guess them and I just went off of my reactions. There were a lot of people that were really good at anticipating them. Yeah. That's where I totally screwed myself mm. because I, I had it so wrapped up in my head that Eric is so much better out at the start than I am mm -hmm. that I had to do something special, but I've been counting the starts all night and I knew I had the count, right? Yeah. So I, I knew that it was on a one, two go. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the tape, I went one, two and my whole body moved yeah. and the tapes went up and I just went, Oh, <laughs> if I would have let the clutch out, to what I knew was going to happen, mm. I'd be world champion. Yeah. And I'll never, I, it's, you see my body flinch and then I, and then the tapes go up and you're like, Oh my goodness. Like, I remember, I remember that happening going, go. Oh no. Mm. And he made the start. And so it is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I should have just stuck with what I, and then I don't know what would have happened then. No, if I, I would have just went off of watching it, who knows? But the whole third in the world thing, um, they forced me to go out for the, for the runoff. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't going out. I, I was, I, I lost the world championship. Mm. This whole interview, I've said that my goal is to be a world champion. I could care less what I did in the, in the qualifying rounds mm. to get there. I went there to be world champion. I could care less if I was second or 15th. Yeah. So when I just lost the world championship, when I, when I felt I should have won, because mm -hmm. I guess the start, I should have done what I did. I didn't want to go out. I don't care. I don't care if I'm second or third, give it to hands. I, like I could care less. Well, then they, they, that's why it took so long for us to come out. Yeah. They threatened to suspend me for the rest of the year. Uh, okay. The FIM did. And, and there probably is a rule about that. That's the only way they got me on the track. Obviously I was going to lose because mm. I could, I mean, again, and I'm not making an excuse. I just could care less. Yeah, I just I went through the motions. Um, I'll bounce ahead to the following year. Mm. The following year, we were at the Intercontinental Final. Myself and Hands were in a runoff. I think it was for second or third. I don't know. Yeah, what it was. And when we did the coin toss, I won the coin toss and gave him the better starting position which was exactly the same positions we were at Gothenburg. <laughs> and I, and I remember saying this to hands, um, I'm going to show you, I would have beat you in <laughs> Gothenburg. And mm. he obviously laughed and I made the start and I beat him. Yeah, he did. It's just ironic, but, <laughs> but I remember like, again, I qualified for the world final. Mm. So I didn't again, give a shit. Yeah. I'm just like, you know what hands? I'm going to give you the better, the better gate position, the exact thing we had in Gothenburg. And I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to show you, I, I could have beat you. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. It just turned out that way, but <laughs> that was, that was my little satisfaction deep down, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, at that point, then I truly believe that I was number two. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't number three because look, I just beat him. <laughs> yeah, but I can understand it's just that, all riders' mind games, right? Yeah, hundred percent. But I mean, I can understand feeling deflated and you think, "Well, it's a pointless runoff." Hands is, is riding better than me anyway. Now I'm not, my my head's not in it, you know. So why why do it? But obviously, like you said, if the if the FIM are going to threaten you, you think actually I better just go through the motions and get done and out of the way, you know, things yeah. like that, you know. But um, going to that back to that 84 final i do have the footage of that probably that one pass all night from 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 Gothenburg. i mean it was I, i'm not gonna say it wasn't um a little rough mm. but your net you, this this was my whole attitude was you know what it's the world championship and you don't get another day yeah 
Um, you can't say, Hey, you know what? I'll do better tomorrow. It's now or never. Mm -hmm. And um, again, you never give up. So you never know what's going to happen. Exactly. I mean, this is, this is the race now. And obviously you Carl Mars in front and you're racing him down and trying to chase him down. Um, the bite length gap is huge at this point. Yeah. I mean, you can see it's just coming off, off of a track prep after in heat 13 sort of thing. So, you know, the track's a bit more grippier, I can imagine, because obviously they've raked all the outside. Yeah, obviously we both picked up grip at the same spot there. Mm. And I was just like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That was my time, right? Mm. Um, but again, you never give up. And um, I found an opening and just sort of went for it. Yeah, and I mean, we powered powered yourself to the line, blocked his blocked his move, and that was it. That's all she wrote. Yeah, I mean, he obviously had to get out of the gas. Yeah, because I took his line, but um, again, that's the world championship. I would I would expect somebody to do that to me. Yeah, yeah. and there's no you know, and he I don't I don't believe that Carl was mad. He just like you know what, hey, good for you, you beat me, mm -hmm. um, and every, everybody rides harder in world championship races than than they than they would in a league match yeah 100 and, and if they and if they don't then they're never going to be the best yeah exactly exactly so and i mean yeah I mean, it wasn't your day in gothenburg but you came close you came close um they like said at the intercontinental final the following year to to winning that one beating hands proving that you are number two in the world really <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll, stick, we'll, we'll, stick, we'll stick with that one we'll say that yeah we'll, we'll stick with that for now but um yeah and i mean it must have been not nice just to sort of like again like I say put one over him and beat him at uh, a world championship because obviously him and eric were knocking lumps out of each other that that's uh like over those those few years you know it must have been sort of like nice for yourself to sort of um say yeah okay i can beat you on these big occasions sort of thing and it was nice too that i i spent the whole year in the states yes and, that's true yeah and 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 coming spending the whole year in the states and coming over I had exactly the same machinery that I ended up the year in 84 that I left in England, in Europe, that I came back and rode. So yeah. the exact same bike that I rode in the world final in Gothenburg was the bike that I rode in the overseas intercontinental and the world final. Mm. So my machinery wasn't as good. Mm. There's, there's just no way. Um, and obviously my, my, my learning curve pretty much plateaued. It didn't get any better in the States. I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I hate to say it. I wasn't riding against anybody better than myself. Um, not to say that I was the best in the States, but just, I just didn't, it was more of just having fun that year yeah. and racing. So coming over and doing what I did in the overseas and, and, you know, at Bradford, I, I got last in my first race. Mm. I switched bikes and then I won every race after that. So for me, that was a huge, a huge boost because like, wow, I, I rode in the States all year and I just won four races in a row mm. against the best in the world. And then it was raining and stuff for the intercontinental final, but did good there. So, I mean, I had a lot of confidence going to the world final, even though I didn't race in Europe that the whole year, Yeah, which sucks because looking back at it now, who knows how good a I could have been if I rode there the whole year in 85, mm. you know, yeah. I, I definitely wouldn't have been worse. Mm. So, you know, and then, and then the, the, the world final, uh, you know, just didn't go my way in Bradford. I, my machinery, I wasn't, wasn't good enough. I wasn't sharp enough. Mm. You know, again, the overseas final and the intercontinental final are different than the world final. Yeah. And it just, it showed that I wasn't there all year. Mm. I, I mean, you know, I had some good races, but it just showed that I wasn't there all year. Yeah. So what was the decision then? Why, why, did you, why didn't you come back over then in 85 then? Was it uh, something in particular? Um, yeah. Um, who was our promoter at Cradley? I think it might have been still... Peter Adams, maybe might have been there, or would it Colin Pratt? One of the one of the two. Colin Pratt, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, at the time, 
I didn't realize it. Mm. And it took me about a year to figure this out afterwards. But he pretty much screwed me out of racing in Europe. Oh, right. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is the whole off season, he's telling me, hey, Lance, you know, I want to keep you, but I, I, ha I have the world champion. I have Eric Gunderson. I don't have the money and the way the points average and all of that to keep both of you. Mm. I can't keep you and trade away the world champion. If I wanted to, doesn't matter if I don't, I just can't do that. Mm. I got to keep Eric. Um, and I get that, but they were still negotiating contracts. So none of this was, so what I was told anyway, and he's like, Hey, he goes, you know what? We're still not coming to terms. So I, I can't release you yet because, and I'm like, you know, and again, I'm still really young yeah. and I don't have, and I didn't have a manager at that point. If I'd have had a manager, it would have been different because he would have said he either shit or get off the pot. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Make, make a move. Yeah. But I'm like, ah, you know, it's all good. I just had the best year of my life. Um, I'm going to be wanted in Europe, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but he left it so late that by the time he said, hey, you know what? I came to terms with Eric and I got to let you go. No other team had a slot for me Yeah, with my average. So, like, I had nowhere to go. Yeah, out in the wilderness, so 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 to speak, you know, where nobody could nobody could fit you in. So right, but. and and I'm I'm assuming that if he'd have let me go, you know, in November, mm. December, I might have had a spot somewhere. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I'm yeah. hoping, I'm hoping that another team would want to pick me up. But at that point, I was like, oh wow, I can't believe it. Mm. I'm I, I don't have a spot. Um. I guess I'll just ride here in the States. Yeah. It, it's, and that's how that all came down is, is there was just nowhere for me to go. And unfortunately in my era, there wasn't, you know, Poland, there wasn't Sweden, there wasn't all of those places I could have, I could have went to. Um, it was the British league or nothing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I put that on Cullen. Mm. Uh Again, he's might have been hedging his bets. You know, he might have been using Eric against me, or I mean, me against Eric yeah. to get him to 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 agree. Mm. I don't, I don't know. It could have been all BS. I should have probably called Eric and said, "Hey, because we were that good of friends. Hey, mm. what's going on? What, yeah. What's happening?" And but I just didn't. Again, young, naive, thinking I had the world by the you know what and. <laughs> It ended up backfiring on me. So, mm. had any any other clubs and approached you at all up, up until that point? Then to, to go there? No, they they can't approach you until Cradley lets you go. Oh, okay. So Cradley literally had their claws on you then, literally. So yes. yeah. So in, until Cradley put me on the market, no other team can talk to you. Oh, okay. All right. That was my understanding anyway. Right. Yeah, we might, we might have been Colin's idea, but you never know. You never know looking back. But. Right, and, and you know, if I had other teams talking to me, then, you know, maybe I'd have said, hey, either sign me or let me go mm -hmm. because I have Swindon or whoever it may be. Um, but, yeah, that didn't happen. Yeah, and obviously then you stayed back in, in the States. And like you said, you qualified for the 85 World Final. Um, Bradford, an amazing track. Um, they had wasn't it? They had rain in the, in the morning of that, that meeting and the track was yeah. quite wet to start with. Which was actually perfect for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but two things happened is when we rode the overseas final there, it was pretty slick, mm. which played into my engines not being as good. The world final, there was more grip, mm. and that's when my engines not being as good as the rest of the field really raised its head. Yeah, it's like it, you know, as the meeting went on, I got faster because the dirt was too far away, mm. and riding, you know, in the slickest part of the track worked for my bike. 
uh, unfortunately I couldn't ride where I wanted to ride yeah. because I just didn't have the power. Mm. Because obviously there's that that one race. I think it was Eric's last ride. It was you and Sean um, out. You managed to outgate Eric, and Eric did the big one around both you and Sean. So I think um, I remember watching it uh, maybe about a year or so ago. Thinking, look, looking at it, because obviously Sam was in it. Sam was going to be having the runoff with hands. I was thinking, if if Lance and Sean just team ride Eric out a bit more, they would have <laughs> helped Sam out to join us, have a two man runoff. But um, but yeah, I mean. That must have been like, oh crap, he's going for it now, isn't he? Sort of thing as he went past you. Uh, um, um, <laughs> he's thinking screw about it. it. <laughs> I'll I'll say it. There's going to be a lot of people that are that are going to hate me for this, but I don't I don't care. Okay. Um, myself and Sam mm. were never the best friends. Oh, okay he was the only American that was not 100% American on the team, mm. meaning that Sam was there a lot for himself. Okay. We had something in our, and I'm not going to beat up Sam because Sam, it, he's one of the best riders mm. ever. The guy's an amazing talent. He was going to win a world championship, which obviously he did. Um, I'm obviously very good friends with Eric. Yeah. Eric came and asked me for a favor. <laughs> I'll just put it this way. Have you ever seen Eric pass me? Uh, not that I can think of or remember seeing. No. Have you ever seen me ride the line at Bradford? No, because I think if you remember right, you came, you, you rode three and four a bit tighter than you had done in the previous lap. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's fair enough. And I'm sure people can put two and two together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a fair for, enough. For me, it sucks because everybody's like, oh my God, he rounded you guys up and all that. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah. Because I rode where I shouldn't have. Yeah. There's no way that he would have ever passed me and Sean. Mm. There's, if, if I rode the right line and didn't pinch Sean off, yeah. there's no way he'd ever pass us. No. So I'll just leave it at that. And you know what? Um, I would do the same again. Mm. And um, I'm sorry, Sam, <laughs> but you that became world enough. champion anyway. And uh, it is what it is. Yeah. And I mean, it's happened. Nobody can change what happened. And obviously people can have their opinions about stuff, but at the end of the day, it's happened, you know, um, and Eric, went on if to you're a Gunderson it. fan, you're going to love me. If you're a, a Malenko <laughs> fan, you're going to hate me. Oh, well, we can, nice to have a bit of controversy a little bit on this one. But. <laughs> That's what I told you at the beginning. I'm a little too honest sometime and I got nothing to hide. Nah, that is what it is. No, nah, it's, it's in, in a weird way. It's nice to hear these sort of things because obviously nobody knows what happens behind sort of closed doors. And of course, right. people have said stuff about from other riders that said, oh, yeah, we help, help me out, help you out type of thing. You know, so it's, it's always gone on in Speedway, but it's, yeah. it's just interesting to hear it from a different person. So, and things like that. But, um, before the, um, I think it was the world final, you had, again, you had the world team cup, you had it in long beach. Um, that must've been nice for yourself to have the, the have, have a final in America again, you know, in front of the home fans, you know, and not again, a nice stadium to have with that. Um, it must've been a buzzing atmosphere that night. Yeah. And for me, it was a home meeting because yeah, I was true. home that year. Mm. I, I mean, for me, it was like, what I missed riding in Europe is seeing all of my American buddies mm. and that, and that, and that, that, that team and, and having them be able to come back home. And I, it was like a family reuni reunion, you know? Mm. So for me, it was, it was a home meeting cause I was at home. Long beach is probably about 20 minutes from my house. Yeah. Um, and having it in America and having, you know, it was, it was, it was great again. I didn't have the bikes, the engines for that, for, for that level of, of competition, especially because um, Long Beach is pretty deep all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's probably deeper than it should be, but that's just how the Amer Americans made their tracks, the, the yeah. promoter. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was an awesome meeting. Um, and uh, it would have been a great one to win. 
Yeah, hundred percent. But obviously, it was you and Denmark near enough level pegging for the whole meeting. Obviously, England came third, Sweden came fourth. But they were like again twenty or points behind you and you and the uh, Denmark sort of thing. But you know, I've got I've got a bit of footage again from from these meetings. I've got a couple of your races. One of them being you, you're out in yeah, heat and, one. And, and I didn't. And, and you know, I'll be the first one to say that I I let the team down a little bit. I again, I don't think my machinery was up to par, but. I just didn't have the best of nights. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, this is heat one. Um, I think by Peterson got excluded in the first stage of it um, and everything. There, there's you on the on gate one um, and everything. Do you remember much about this first race? I don't remember anything about it at all. Oh, okay, well, this, this is one of the controversial bits because um, the... the, the uh, Phil Collins on gate four got excluded for allegedly breaking the tapes when you could see it was the Swede next to him who yeah. broke the tapes, you know, um, and things like that. So obviously that was uh, the, first, the, the second stage. So the third stage of it, it was only like a two-man runoff near enough <laughs> in heat well, one. That's, that's probably the easiest way for me to make, get any points. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> well, we don't, we don't get to see the whole race of it, but we get to see like the first couple of laps of it. But um, yeah, there, there's you chasing. I mean, they're, they're, again, so you're racing down the back straight, trying to dive underneath him, you know, and, and move him over. I mean, it's just great to watch as a fan and you know, see you, you like banging handlebars like mm-hmm. so close to each other, you know. And they, there you go, dive them up, up the inside line. Oh, that had to have been my highlight for the night because I don't remember riding that well. I think that was, that was the only heat when you had, I think it was. The rest of yeah. the time you got seconds and stuff like that. So, yeah, and then standings again after heat number one but yeah that i mean that that was a nice one to see i do have a, a another another bit of um footage from that mean which i which i like is one of my personal favorite races from that final um it's when you met uh, uh mr nilson again um in this one uh just if i just share it and everything uh okay All right i say look at the you look, at, look at the score line already oh, wow. you know, the score is oh, really really close to eight yeah so you know, yeah, I mean, that was that's after heat twelve. So this is like the last round of rides. So it's just, the things you, it's your last ride of the evening. Um, yeah, so there's hands and things like that. So you know, and I mean, I, I mean, I can imagine the whole crowd was on your side and things like that. Mm-hmm. As you with Bruce, have put your goggles back on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened there, but thanks, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bruce, like, hey, you forgot your goggles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're getting so you can get the, the guy on the fence next to you here, like, cheering you on. And you think, Jesus Christ, how close do you want to get to you? <laughs> yeah. Like, it, a lot of things in America, I mean, we did probably weren't the safest, but. Yeah, you're passionate. That's what it is. It's passion. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is, so this is one of my favorite races from the, from the final, anyway. So, but, oh. Uh, was you a fan of bumping the tapes? Uh, no. No, okay. It actually helped me when uh, uh, he didn't run me wide at all. No, but I like it. This is absolutely oh. level pegging, you know. And then yeah, that's where if I had all of a sudden you get some, power. <laughs> <laughs> get some drive from somewhere. But unfortunately, hands goes on to, to win it. But I can see what you mean, though, by saying that you probably your equipment wasn't quite on par to, compared to previous seasons because obviously you weren't riding in England. Yeah, you know, and and uh, it wasn't bad, mm. but at that level, you know, it's it's so important to 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 have as good or better, right? Uh, you yeah. know, it just and you could just see going down the straightaway how he's pulling me, and and a lot of times it's bike setup and all of that, but when there's that much dirt, it's all about the motor, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is what it is, and I raced at home all year, and and I had somebody bring me one of my in, the engine that I rode in the overseas final and all that. Mm-hmm. They brought it over for my bikes here. Yeah. So I mean, in saying that, you know, on a on a Westlake still, um, that that wasn't too bad, you know. No, exactly. Yeah, it's just going to show you a, a replay of of, uh, of the whole race from a different point of view. But yeah, almost made it down. Yeah, almost. But the drive and the right corner there, see if, if I'd have just had hands, it's like, oh, I own you. Yeah. 
but no, it's, it's great to watch it because obviously you get to hear your side of it as well and things like that. Yeah. But yeah. definitely my type of track with the dirt and everything, you know. Oh, yeah. And obviously, again, being a big track and things like that, you know, suit you, suit you down to the ground. But obviously then um, you return to uh, sunny Britain, shall we say, um, in, in, in 86. Um, that was with was that was with Bradford, wasn't it, you came back with? So that must yep. have been a nice move to go to Bradford. Yeah, I, I mean, it was one of those where I got a, a phone call like late at night. <laughs> um, and uh, I was half asleep and, and it was Bradford and, and, and I think it was the Ham Brothers. Yes, it would have been, yeah. And, and they introduced themselves and I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know who you are, you know, I, <laughs> and I'm all groggy and, and they're like, you know, Hey, we would be, you know, we were wondering if you'd be interested in racing for Bradford and, and, uh, and I'm just like, like, like who, who's Bradford? Like, what is Bradford? <laughs> I don't know. And anyway, a long story short, it, it, uh, I was like, I don't know if I want to go back to Europe. Like I had such a blast in the States that, that I don't know if I want to go back to Europe. Mm. And, um, it just, it just worked out. And, and one, I look, I like Bradford's track because when I left there, Bradford didn't have a team. Yeah. So that's why when they said, would you like to ride for Bradford? I'm like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, and then they said, well, it would be like the old Halifax team. Mm. And then first thing, Kenny Carter, Mm. And I'm like, oh, that, that's interesting that I'm even being asked because I just didn't ever think that an American would be teamed with Kenny. Yeah. Because Kenny is obviously the number one of that team. And any team, if I was a team captain of a team and I had my number one rider, mm in a Kenny or a Bruce Penhall or a Eric Gunderson or whoever it may be, Hans Nielsen, I would say, Hey, you know what? I'm think I would call them and say, Hey, I'm thinking about bringing Lance King onto the team. What do you think? And I asked them that, have you talked to Kenny about this? And they're yeah. like, no, no, we haven't. And I'm like, you know, um, I've never had a beef with Kenny ever. Mm. Um, but I just said, you know, I think it'd be like a good idea. He might, he might not want me there. And then, and then you're, and then you're making a mistake because then we have this, this confrontation right off the bat, which mm -hmm. I don't think is good for anybody. I, I don't want that. That's what the team's supposed to be. I don't know if that ever happened, if you ever talked to Kenny or not, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but I agreed because I love Bradford's track. And I thought, oh, you know, that would be, that would be up my alley, may get some good engines and yeah, I wouldn't mind. It's, you know, crazy far from my house every, mm. every time, but, but I would enjoy riding there. That's why I enjoyed Cradley so much because I love the track. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of teams out there that um, I don't care how much money they paid me. I wouldn't race there on a weekly basis. Cause I just didn't think that that, that would be fun for me. And it wouldn't be a track where I would excel at. And Bradford was one. So mm. I, I agreed. And I, you know, obviously thought of, put the phone down, thought about it. And, and yeah, so I was back in, back in England again. That was pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. And I'm a, it's, a, it's a brand new team there enough. Cause obviously they like say it's that old Halifax going into a new stadium at Bradford. Just wondering what was it like to ride at Bradford every week then? You know, was it a um, good, good track to go to every week? Oh, well the track, the tracks, the track's great. Mm -hmm. Um, the track's great. The, um, uh, it was, it was interesting. It was a challenge. It was, I totally felt like an outsider coming into that team. Yeah. I got treated as an outsider. I, I, uh, it was, it was, it was tough. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the, the ham brothers were great. Actually, Kenny was good. Neil was good. There was, um, it still wasn't a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, come on in, you know, your family. And I was like, okay, you know, that'll, that'll get better. 
Mm. I don't get, they don't know me. I don't know them. I'm an American. They're very, very, very pro, pro Kinney, yeah. you know, I mean, their, their little clan they had, you know, and, and I get that. They don't know, you know, and then once we got to know each other, it got a little bit better. Um, I, Kinney was, Kinney surprised the hell out of me. All right. As far as how nice he was to me. Mm -hmm. And, and how well we got on, I, I didn't expect that because mm -hmm. obviously it's always the controversy between him and, and Bruce. Yeah. And that's all I knew. I, the only thing I knew at the races was, you know, it was like us against him sort yeah. of thing. But when I, when I got to know him, obviously things were different. I sit on the fence all the time and listen to everybody bicker back <laughs> to this day. And I just yeah. keep my views to myself, but um, I, I have nothing but good things to say about Kenny mm -hmm. of my experiences. Uh, but the rest of the team, it was always riding at Bradford was, I was more of a team than they were meaning, oh, right. meaning, it felt to me that everybody was there for themselves. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. I never felt comfortable if I needed a part or I needed something that they would be more than willing to like, here's the part. Mm -hmm. It would be like, Hey man, here's this wheel, but, but you know, like that's one of my good wheels and, 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 and you know, like, I'm going to need that back. Uh, literally this mm -hmm. happened a lot. And you're like, I can't believe I'm negotiating with you right now <laughs> yeah. to try to win this match where at Cradley, it'd be like, here it is. When you have time, give it back to me. Yeah. Like, like I had to, it was just that kind of a feeling mm -hmm. and it was so hard for me. It was so hard to just be there for myself. Yeah. And that sucked. And it sucked because the more that I would try to rally the teams, the, the more I try to help out, the more I got that look like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. like what? Like, I know how to ride. <laughs> like, why are you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I got that, that feeling. And then, I mean, I would go out there and ride and come back and just sit in my pits. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just tough. Yeah. It, it seems like it was just more like it was a job sort of thing. Whereas when you're at Cradley with, with Eric and Yano and, and Phil Collins, you know, people like that, you know, you had a fun, you had laughs, you know, you, it was more like you and a bunch of mates going out to ride my bikes sort of thing, right? Rather than going there that you feel like you have to ride here, you know, and it's, oh, if Bradford win, great. If I don't win, eh, what, whatever sort of thing, you know, whereas if I can imagine at Cradley, you guys wanted to win. Okay. You, you, you lost a few meetings, but you enjoyed the meeting still. Yeah. And, and a hundred percent. And the thing, it, the thing that, 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 it became, it became a job. Mm. It just became a job. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and I, I never realized it because I've always raced until I got into the world, you know, yeah. but you know, one of the most important things is to be happy when you go to work. Right. And yeah. God, that must suck when you have a job that 90% of the public that they have to make the money to put the food on the table. They don't like going to work. Mm. And that's what that was like almost not that bad. Cause I'm still racing a motorcycle for a living, Yeah, but I was just there just like, Oh yeah, I got that meeting, got that meeting. Then I was like, Oh, this sucks. I have to drive two and a half hours mm. to go to somewhere that, I'm not sort of really even wanted or, yeah. or, you know, it just, it, you know, without being too bitter on it, it just, it's not what I thought, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and my whole, my whole, my whole uh, program was suffering. Mm. My whole, um, it became where I wasn't, I was losing the drive to be world champion. Yeah. 
it was because, like I said, becoming more of a job. Mm-hmm. And this is already in 86. Yeah. Um, where I wasn't, I wasn't um, willing to put every dime back into my bikes, back into mm-hmm. my program, back into everything mm. to be world champion. Cause I already, I, I already almost became world champion and what did it get me? Yeah. It no. basically got me a trip home. Mm. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah. So yeah. then, so yeah. then I start, so then I'm at a team where nobody's really a team. Mm. I'm there by myself and I'm like, okay, so if I put all of my money back into the racing, it didn't really get me much in the end. Yeah. Yes, I want to be world champion, but that's where my mind started going. Um, and um, that basically, if you look at all the next three years, mm. that sums up my 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 years. Yeah. And it sums up like guy you ne- you you didn't you didn't make another world final and you didn't and i look back at it now and 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 even then i knew like my head wasn't in it yeah i mean it wasn't in it like before mm. um i truly believe and this is just my 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 belief if i would have stayed at cradley i definitely would have been a world champion yeah, that, that, that's 100% probably Because my drive would have been 100%. It would have never faltered. Yeah. Um, and I would have been in a place that loved me, that I loved them, that it was, and it just, it, it, you know, and, and then um, I don't want to go, you know, then if you want to hop to the next year, mm. it's sort of the same scenario, but about halfway or three, about halfway through, through the year, I got a call from the management saying, Hey, we're struggling. Mm. And, um, we want to put everybody on the same pay rate. Okay. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm (laughs) not in for that. No. Um, obviously in the locker room that again, I'm pretty honest. They're all like, Hey, so, uh, so Lance, what did you say? I said, I'm not doing it. Mm-hmm. And then, so half the team's like pissed off at me because they feel that I'm going to sh- shut the club down. Mm-hmm. Um, because they were going to make more money than they've ever made. Yeah. Cause we were all going to be on the same point money and, and all that. And I was, and I was like going to be obviously considerably less. Mm-hmm. And my point is, is in our contracts, we have a, a clause that says that we have to have a number one machinery at all times. Yeah. At every track, blah, 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 be, you know, be there a hundred percent. So my, my point and my question to the Ham brothers was, if I blew up four engines in mm-hmm. one week, would you have given me five grand to buy to, to get more engines and all that? And they said, no, no, because it's in your contract to make sure that you have the best equipment. And I said, exactly. It's also in my contract that you're supposed to pay me this. Yeah. And now you're coming back saying, oh, we want to pay you less than half. So uh, it's a double standard here. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, but that was your commitment. I made my commitment. I've, it doesn't matter if I ball bikes up and, and I had to pay for them. So that's where that went. So then I just went, you know what? Um, I, I, I guess I'll check out and go home. Yeah. So that's what happened with Bradford. Mm. And, and I, and I don't, and I don't think I was wrong. Um, and me, by me leaving, meaning I'm not going to bring the club down. And it was, it was, it was my choice. I'm like, you know what? I'm not here because the BS, I could have forced them to give me my money. Yeah. 
but then they might have had to close. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to cause you guys to close down. Uh, again, I'll check out. Yeah. And then, uh, so that's what happened there. Yeah. It kind of, it, it sucks really. Cause obviously, yeah, you're hundred percent to stick by your guns. Cause, uh, why, why should sort of like a, a reserve be on the same points money as Lance King, who's number one, um, at this point, you know, and things like that. And then he's probably the reserve probably could, uh, make his equipment up to the A1 standard or whatever he would have. But then you, like I said, on the flip side, your equipment is going to suffer because you can't replace a blown up engine or a cracked frame or whatever like that, you know, it, the cost mounts up. And also you've got a house, you know, you've got other bills to pay. It's your only sort of source of income, you know, and it's like, you know, it's like the carpet has been swept from underneath you a little bit. So you've probably had the right decision just to go home and say, well, that's it. That's my season sort of over with and finish off in, in the States. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's basically what happened. And then, and then at that point I thought, okay, you know, that, that's, that's it. Mm. You know, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah. And then I got a call from Kings Lynn. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't know. If I, 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 again, a track I really like. I really yeah. like Kings Lynn. So, okay, so that's a good race track. Again, crazy far from my house. <laughs> and then, you know, every all the, all the matches that we're going to have that are not league matches are going to be against Ipswich and all mm. these places down there that are – three and a half hours from my house. I'm like, Oh no, not again. But I was, but I really liked Malcolm. Yeah. And, and basically Malcolm and, and JD, mm. John Davis, yeah. um, they were my, they were my decision. Mm. One is I really liked those guys. We've yeah. always been friends and I'm like, well, maybe I'm going back to a, a friendly place, you know, like yeah. friends. I didn't really know anybody at Bradford on the team mm. except for racing against him. So then I said, you know, we made a deal and I was like, I'm in. I, what the hell? Let's do this. Yeah. And um, so I started racing at Kings Lynn. Yeah. And I mean, it must have been, um, again, a nice, as I say, a family, a bit more of a family sort of atmosphere. Everybody was helping each other sort of thing a bit more. You know, it was, obviously it wasn't, it wasn't going to be ever cradley, but it was like, it's probably the next best thing for you, especially that sort of time in your career as well. Yeah, it was, it was better. Richard Knight never, he never got on board. He always, mm. w w he was, to me, was never really a team, team guy, you know? Yeah. Um, but it w it was much better. Mm. and it was a much better atmosphere and it was it, it brought some fun back into it 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 um but it never got me to have that drive again yeah that 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 like that 100 percent. i'm in this to be world champion and there is no there there's 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 nothing else that'll 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 do mm. yeah um you know, and, and it just, yes, every time I race for the States, every time I race World Team Cups, I raced individual. I'm not going to go anywhere and not give it 110%. Yeah. But you have to give it 110% everywhere, not just the racetrack, mm. to, to be competitive with these guys. Yeah. To, to be the best in the world. Just being there at the racetrack is not enough, you know. No you have to put the big money in your, in your engines and your bikes and, and all of that. And, and, you know, back in back 84 on, I mean, I was factory Westlake. I mean, I got, I got everything for free, a hundred percent of everything for free. Mm -hmm. When I came back in 86, 87, 88, I was buying almost everything. Yeah. So that was a big expense. And then it, you know, it becomes that, that, uh, that return on investment. Is it, it, you know, is it worth it? Is it, is it not blah, yeah. blah, blah. But, but I was having fun and, and I, I enjoyed my time at Kingsland and again, a great racetrack for me. Yeah. And I mean, the whole way through, you said that the main goal was to have fun and enjoy it. You know, that's, that's the main thing, you know, things like that. But you had um, a certain Mr. Hancock come and sort of stay with you for 89. I mean, what was that sort of like then to have this young kid, you know, you looking up to you and like you're teaching him the ways that uh, to be a spirit rider. 
you know, Greg is, uh, is a, is a special person, you know, as we know now, but going back to 89, obviously nobody knew what he was going to do. Yeah. Um, and he's such a soft spoken kid and, and he's, uh, and like, uh, I was, I was extremely rough on him mm. now that I look back at it, you know, I had a different, I had a different attitude on racing, even yeah. though that I said that, even though I've been saying that, you know, let my drive to become world champion, you know, that 100% world championship, I'm maybe at 85 now mm. percent. I still, what I did and how I did things and my work ethic and all of that, I think was second to none. It's, you know, again, a lot coming from Eric. Yeah. Greg didn't have that. Mm. Greg was that nonchalant, like, Hey, how's it going? Just like <laughs> he is now. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> he his, his, yeah. his personality hasn't changed at all. Yeah. But it just, it, it's funny. Cause like we talk about this, we're like best friends, you know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and I, and I, and I, I just wrote him. I'm like, dude, this isn't going to work. And you need to do it this way and do it that way. And, and, um, you know, there was times where obviously his equipment wasn't good enough. Mm. And so I let him ride my bikes because I'm like, Hey, look, ride mine, do that, you know, do this, do that. Because again, if you don't get that average, you're not going to be coming back. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I did everything I could to, to, to help Greg. Mm. Uh, there were times where I had to pull back cause I thought I was hurting him more than helping him because I was just riding his ass so hard on every, on everything. Cause yeah. that was, that was 100% my personality. Mm. I, uh, if it was my way or the highway kind of thing, you know, yeah. um, he says now that I, that he's, you know, used what I taught him and all of that kind of stuff back in the day. And, uh, which is, which is flattering, mm. but, but, and I, and again, I hope it helped him. It, but you know i almost think think sometimes he says that just to be nice but because <laughs> that's just greg right yeah greg's being greg but yeah i mean any sort of help like that would have helped him in good stead anyway in the, in the long run you know sort of thing keep his sort of him grounded you know not to go and do anything stupid learn how to sort of do everything in england rather than doing it sort of like maybe the californian type of way you know it's a complete different way of way of life way of living traveling everything and of course you've been there and done it and got the t-shirt so to speak you know of um of, of living living the the british league sort of thing so yeah it must have been good to also maybe keep you on your toes at that sort of time in your career thinking oh this this kid's gonna start nipping at my heels soon yeah it's it's great to it, it was great to have him there at my house and it was obviously awesome to have another american there and greg yeah um i i i look back at it now and I wish I wouldn't have left after 89 because mm. who, first of all, who would have known he, how great he would have become, but how much, how much quicker I think that he would have, uh, that, that learning curve, you know, yeah. would yeah. have been a little bit steeper the following year because, you know, I, I think I could have really helped him out the next, the following year. Mm. Um, I thought of that for years after that, and then not, not having any idea, like, you know, obviously he'd figured this out on his own mm. and, and become, you know, the, the best American that's ever been on a, on a speedway bike. So. Yeah. And obviously you could say that you played a key role in, in his early beginnings in, in Europe. I hope so. In a, you know, a, I mean, um, again, he still had to put it together and he still had to do it. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's done a good good turn for American Speedway and, and World Speedway. You know, I mean, fortunately enough, I mean, he's done so much great things for for the sport. You know, and uh, and, so, and he's he's too nice a guy anyway to be really riding. You know, I still think he was too he was too nice. You know, but then again, he could do it on the track week in week out. So, you know, which was was a good thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, what an ambassador for the sport, right? And oh, yeah. you know, they say the nice guy never wins. Well, he's <laughs> he's he's obviously uh, proved that wrong yeah. because he is a nice guy. And again, he, he does when the chips are down and, and he's on the racetrack, 
he's a different person. Mm. Um, but, but how he goes to, about things and everything are totally different the way that I would go about things. Um, as far as, is is his mindset and all that on a, just how he deals with certain things at the track, Yeah, but that's what works for him. That's what makes every writer, you know, some writers are, you know, and, and again, I don't know Nikki Pedersen very much, mm. but he has a different way of psyching himself up than a Greg Hancock does or, yeah. you know, or, or myself mm. and that kind of stuff. Like, like I, I literally, I literally, was never i never thought that this is crazy i i don't even know how to put it in words i never went to a race thinking i was going to win mm. ever okay. ever the times that i went there that the, the the few times that i went going you know what i'm just going to kick these guys butt i got my hand my ass handed to me mm. uh, for some that's why i think in the in all of the world championship races and the, the races that meant the most, I was so nervous and so afraid of being beat that that was my energy. That was like my kryptonite. Yeah. And I was so afraid of being beat that it made me better. Yeah. It made, it, it made me come to. Mm. I was never, and they always say, you know, you have to, the sports psychologists are saying, you know, you have to think that you're the best and you have to know that you're the best and you have to know that you can beat these guys and all that. I, that was, I was 100% the opposite. I was 100% the opposite. Mm -hmm. I, yes. Did I know that I could beat these guys? Yeah. Cause I've done it. Did I know I could be the best? Well, I hope. <laughs> But I mean, when I was up against hands and Eric and everybody, I'm just like, I was hoping that it scared the shit out of me <laughs> to think that I was going to lose to them. Mm. It was more that I was going to lose to them that how much than beating them, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. It's basically, basically, basically the sort of like the opposite to what the say, sports colleges say, the sort of thing, because obviously you've got to visualise yourself winning and all that sort of thing. You did the opposite so that maybe if you did lose, you didn't get sort of too down by it or, or whatever, but then it inspired you in the opposite side to make sure you do beat these guys because you don't want to feel that sort of like, oh, crap, I didn't beat them sort of thing, you know. So it's good, but it's, it's almost like the opposite way around to what, what all these um, psychologists say nowadays. Yeah, it was interesting. I listened to a podcast, two podcasts actually, uh, with Ricky Carmichael. Mm. Um, and he felt the exact same way I did. And I was like, oh, oh there is somebody else. <laughs> I'm like, and as I'm listening to him, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that, that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. And he was so afraid of losing mm. that he did everything that to not lose. Yeah. And rather than the other other way mm. and i was like you know what wow that that's exactly how i felt he never felt like he was the best he was always worried about not winning yeah. not being the best yeah. which made him the best which was really interesting different different psychology but obviously worked pretty darn well for him you yeah. know and he he tried to be that guy of being the confident guy and all that. And it didn't work for him and it mm. didn't work for me either. That's so I just love how not everything works for everybody. And that's what makes sports so special, right? Yeah. Everybody has to find what works for them. Exactly. And you found, you found a way that worked for you. And of course it's, like I said, it's nice to hear that Ricky Carmichael, I mean, one of the greatest motocrosses of all time to think the same way as you, you know, you know, it's nice that again, two different sports, but you know, thinking the same way, but um, just moving on just before you should wrap up this interview, because it's been great talking to you, Lance. It's just, been amazing to hear your stories and everything. I'm just taking too long. <laughs> no, 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 you're good, you're good, you're good. It's just, it's just, whoa, you know, like all taking it all in. But I just wondered, what sort of was the reason why you sort of like stopped then in the end? Was it because of the accident in '89 at, at, at the um, Cup, or was it something else? Yeah, a lot had to do with the accident. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a that was a a big thing. Um, obviously, Eric was one of my good friends. Yeah, yeah. Probably my probably my best friend that was a non-American mm -hmm. by far. I, I don't know. I, I say that, but Phil Collins, we're really close too. Yeah. But 
Um, but Eric was, was right up there. So mm -hmm. when we had that crash, I remember hitting the ground and running over to Eric. Mm -hmm. And as I look over the medic's shoulder, they're giving him like a trach on the track. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, it's choking me up now. Mm. I was like, oh my God, like my buddy's dead, you know? Mm. First thing I thought. <clears throat> so I like was like all dizzy too from my accident. Mm. So I go to the center green and um, Kelly Moran came running over, I remember, and he's like, dude, you okay? And I'm like, you know, I was telling him about Eric, what I just saw. And, and then Helly came running down and I'm like, Helly, you don't want to go over there, you know, as I'm sitting on the center green. Mm. So, yeah, that was tough. Um, I was very fortunate that um, Gold's Gym has been one of my major sponsors my whole career. And yeah. And I think I, I, I know, I know I was in better shape than every speedway runner. Mm. Um, I, I can say that with confidence. Uh, that was part of my whole training program and my mind program. And that's and looking back at that crash and how I landed. Mm. Um, I know as a fact with my muscles in my neck and all that, I mean, I'm overweight now, but my <laughs> muscles in my neck and everything, that's what saved me from breaking my neck because yeah. I had bone chips in my neck. But I truly believe that, that my being in shape saved my life there possibly. Mm. So yes, that was, that was really tough. Mm. That whole accident. Then um, later on during the year, Kings Lynn, mm. it was like a flashback to Bradford All right. calls me up, says, Hey man, we're not doing that good. I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. <laughs> I, I, I said, and I, I actually finished their conversation and I yeah. said, you could stop talking. Cause I know how this goes. And, and then I went, am I right? And they went, yeah, pretty much. And I said, Nope, sorry. Ain't going to happen. Uh, not again. Mm -hmm. But then I had a, I went to Brisbane in the off season and I had a horrific crash in Brisbane. Oh, okay. I took the guy's wheel coming into turn two or turn, turn three mm. and went straight into the concrete fence. Oh. They actually found my goggles in the stands. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I, I, I remember I clipped the, their rear wheel and just went straight into the fence. Mm -hmm. I obviously don't remember what happened. Mm -hmm. I woke up at the hospital and there was like flowers and cards everywhere. And I'll never forget. I pick up the card that's next to me and it was for Mitch Shira. Oh, okay. He's like, Hey bro, came by to see you on Wednesday. You were totally out of it. I don't know if, if you even know we were here, but can't wait to see you. I'm like, Wednesday, <laughs> the nurse comes by and I'm like, uh, hi. And she's like, oh my God, you, you know, you're awake. And I went, what, what day is it? She's like, it's Friday. And I'm like, wow. I crashed <laughs> Jeez. Saturday. Jeez, maybe a whole so week. I lost a week. Mm -hmm. So I was whatever in a coma for a week. The, they wouldn't let me go home. So luckily for me, the promoter had a, a condo in surfers paradise on the beach. Mm. And he's like, Hey, you can stay there as long as you want to get ready to go home. So I, they wouldn't let me go home. They monitored me for three weeks because of my yeah. head injury. After that, I went, you know what? Um, one of my best friends almost died. And that's when, you know, Eric was having some troubles. Yeah. I just had this crash. I've had two clubs basically say, Hey man, I can't pay you anymore. I'm my mind isn't totally in it. It's a total job. Mm. And, and, and is this wor is risking your life worth just being a job? If there's no, 
end result of wanting to be world champion. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Like if I'm going to go to just a job, then it's going to be a job where I'm not risking my life every day. Yeah. And so it was Eric's crash. It was my crash in Brisbane. It was how I was treated by my last two clubs. And I went, I'm done. Mm. My dad, my dad, and it, it came to a similar, my dad used to race sprint cars. When oh, I was right, yeah. And they didn't have roll cages. They didn't have anything. And he was racing the Sacramento mile. And this all makes sense. So he was racing the Sacramento mile. He was out on his parade lap where they're doing their parade lap and the, his car wasn't running that good. It was cutting out. So mm-hmm. he went into this area called the designated zone, which is sort of a little like on the edge of the track yeah. down the front straightaway. Okay. Yeah. Well, the person that he was in third row outside person in the fourth row outside moved up into his spot. Everybody moved up one. Yeah. The race started. It was crazy, dusty, crazy, dusty. So they came around the first turn, came around turn four. It was so dusty that you could barely even see turn one. So my dad, one of my dad's best friends was like, he said, he looked over, they were working on his car. Mm-hmm. He looked over and he was waving his jacket to slow down. They had flags out and everything because mm-hmm. they couldn't see. He then again, in about 20 seconds later, looked over and saw his shoes sitting there. Jeez. So that's when he went, turned the car off, took his helmet off. What he found out later that the person that, cause they, they stopped the race. Mm, yeah. The person that took his spot got cut in half in the first corner. Whoa. So he lost his life. And my dad's best friend lost his life. He goes, and I'll never, and I grew up hearing this, mm. that somebody told me it's time. Yeah. Like somebody gave me and I just felt that those those things that happened in my career in 89, you know what? Maybe somebody's telling me something. Yeah. And I just felt the same way my dad felt and um I just went, you know what? Enough's enough. Mm. You know? I it just it sucks because uh you know, there was the best years of my life yeah. or some of and it was a blast. And I just, uh, I, again, if I stayed at Cradley, I think, I think, I think my speed career would have been much different. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, again, you don't know what yeah. can happen, but my enthusiasm would have been still there. My desire to be world champion would have still been there. I think I would have never had that year at home, blah, mm. blah, blah. I, I, I definitely think it would have changed. It would have changed my career. Yeah. Cause quite interesting when you say that sort of thing, that uh, all those sort of events are very, very similar, your dad and yourself. And then obviously then the, the move uh, from away from Cradley, you obviously gave this sort of after 85, I think 85, you had a good year anyway, but it was back at home. It wasn't riding in England and you missed that sort of maybe that slight edge, that every so slight edge on, on, on the, um, the European boys, but to come back and like say, have two clubs that basically almost went bankrupt, you know, and then telling you, you know, we've got to, we've got to get rid of you or you've got to have a pay cut. You know, you think, nah, this is, this is, this is not for me. Not, not for me anymore, but um it's sad to hear that it ended that way, unfortunately, because obviously it had such a great career up until those sort of like last two, about the three, three seasons really um, and stuff like that. But on a bit more of a positive note, you've become the USA team manager in recent years. So just give us a brief sort of thing about how that sort of came about. Cause I think everyone was surprised to hear Lance King, what's he doing back here as our team manager sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, um, at the, in the off season, mm-hmm. I would always go down to, I, I wouldn't say always. I basically checked out from the sport. I couldn't tell you who did anything after 89, 90 for yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Um, I just didn't care. Mm. Right. Um, why do I want to watch something that, that I left? So yeah. I wanted to put it on the back burner. So then I have a really good friend in Andy Johnson and, and, and with, with, uh, with Greg. And so I started cycling. I started cy- doing road cycling. Yeah. And then uh, I got with Greg and 
so when he came back for the off season, we were doing some cycling and we're riding down and I think in Hermosa beach. And he's like, Hey, uh, have you ever thought about being um, the uh, team manager? And I just like laughed. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, and he's like, well, I think Billy, I think Billy's going to be going to be backing out mm -hmm. and we need a team manager. And I'm like, my friend, I just laughed. I just thought, <laughs> what? This no, I don't want to be your, the team manager. So then we're riding and, you know, we're riding for a couple hours and mm. obviously a poke here and there back and forth. And <laughs> then I started thinking, huh, well, I haven't been to Europe, been back in to Europe for I don't know how long, you know? And so then I, and then I, so then I talked to, as I said, so are you retiring? He's like, well, no. And I'm like, well, if you're retiring, I'm out. But if you're not retiring, that might be fun, mm -hmm. you know, like sort of bookends, right? Yeah. So then one thing led to another, and I'm like, I went to the races to see the younger riders ride. Obviously, the bikes are totally different. And everything's different, you know, still the same thing, though. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, so Greg got me. Greg uh, asked me to, and so that's, uh, that's what started that. Yeah. And obviously then it's been uh, a roller coaster, obviously, especially last year, obviously being the pandemic year and all that sort of thing. But have you enjoyed being a team manager and seeing all these young kids now coming through and all that sort of thing? At, at times, yeah. <laughs> at times, I'm not going to lie yeah. at times, at times it's been very, 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 very frustrating, mm. especially in the, in the first couple of years, very frustrating. Um, it's different. It, it's the kids are different than when yeah. I grew up. Um, their wants and needs are much different. Mm. The way they look at things is much different. Um, I had, I had a couple of parents that were extremely difficult. Okay. And telling me that I don't know what I'm doing um, I'm a has been, I, uh, why the hell did I even come back? Mm -hmm. Because I'm trying to help their kids and I don't know what the hell I'm doing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it's much different now than it was then mm -hmm. and trying to gain their trust and, and all of that, what I'm asking them to do, like, uh, I'm not going to name names. No. But like myself and Greg would be helping these kids mm. and they're not wanting to listen. All right. But let's just say that we set up one of their bikes mm. and they went out and rode it and was like, Oh my gosh, this is the easiest, fastest, best thing I have ever ridden. So if you're me, yeah. Or, or I'm me, what would you do? I would immediately change all of my bikes to exactly what I just rode. Yep. hundred percent. Total opposite. They went back home. Mm -hmm. I go to the races and I'm like, uh, why is this? And why is that? And why is that? Mm -hmm. And why didn't you change this? And why didn't you change that? Oh, uh, I don't know. You know what? <laughs> a, a bike's a bike. <laughs> and it's got an engine. I'll ride it. Yeah. And I started thinking, oh, wow, like, what a waste of time. Mm. The world champion and myself, I think I know a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and you rode something that you've never rode like that before in your life. Mm. And then you go back and you don't change anything. I'm thinking, God, how serious are you, right? Yeah. And then their parents are telling you that you're an idiot and you're just like, because they're basically, they're telling their kid that that is the better setup, mm -hmm. even though, and they don't want to override them. So anyway, without going into all of that, yeah. it, it's been difficult. And I mm -hmm. almost threw the towel in many, many, many times. Yeah. And Greg and Steve Evans brought me off the ropes and said, Hey, settle down. Just we'll get through this. Mm. And then it's gotten much better. I obviously got the, the, the confidence 
of those kids mm-hmm. that I'm talking about right now. Yeah. And they're, and they're doing great. Mm-hmm. And now they're, they're listening and now it's more of a team. Yeah. It's, you know, we're all in this together. We're all trying to be better. Right. Yeah. So that's been fun. And so, so now that now it's back to being fun. Mm. What sucks is this SON, mm. not the world team cup. Yeah. Um, we've, we've both myself hands and a few others have said, you know what, this reserve that has to be under 21 is a waste of time Yeah, because we understand what you're trying to do, but don't you have an under 21 team championship? Yep. Yep. Well, there you go. That's, that's for the under 21s. Our SON should be the three best in our country. Yeah. Regardless of their age. Because there's countries like myself, like America, that mm. that struggles with that. If you're Poland, your 16 year old could be as good as your fastest three riders. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm not not your 16, but you're under 21. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. I mean, yeah. I, I I mean, so so that's a huge benefit for them. Mm. For us, unfortunately, it's a throwaway race. Mm. Hopefully, one of our riders doesn't get hurt because then now we just have one rider. Yeah. Um, so, so I think they need to change the rules. Mm. So we have three, three of our best riders. I think that we will, we would possibly, I think, make a final. It's yeah. possible. Yeah. I, I think we have, you know, now that we have, you know, Luke Becker and, and, um, and Brock Nickel and, mm. and you know, racing in, in, in England and Europe yeah. and Ricky Wells still there. Um, hopefully, um, Dylan, Dylan Rummel wants to come over really bad. So we're trying yeah. to get him over there. Mm-hmm. Hopefully with the new, with the Brits not being in the EU, yeah, that might help us out because mm-hmm. they all need work permits now, just mm-hmm. like we need work permits. So there might be more lax on getting Dylan over there. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be a big shot in our arm Yeah, because we don't have the money to be bringing people over there. No, especially now that they, that they make it a month away from each other mm. for us bringing riders over from America that, that costs a lot of money. Mm. Then if they're already in, in Europe, like everybody else, then mm. that's not a problem. Otherwise I think you should do it in a week. Yeah. You know, that's just my point. Mm. Um, and I know that I'm rambling on here, but <laughs> one thing that I want to make sure that I, that I get in and you're, this is coming across first with you. Yep. Um, any English clubs that are out there, I'm interested in possibly being a team manager. Ah, okay. That's a great exclusive. I, I put a lot of thought in this and I'm like, I don't know. I, uh, I, I want to do it. I haven't contacted anybody. I haven't put my feelers out. Mm. I just, Thought I would mention it here. Well, there you go. Then. And, and, and that, w- and there's two reasons for that. One is yep. um, what I've been doing since Speedway yep. is I've been teaching in the automotive industry. As far as I per- do personal coaching on racetracks, I'm at uh, country clubs doing personal coaching. Um, I teach at, at, at for Honda and mm. Toyota and other manufacturers. I go into their dealerships and I hold seminars and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I, I really have, I have this huge teaching gene and I had mm-hmm. my own racing schools when I was racing mm-hmm. in the States. So one is for me to do a better job with the Americans for our, our SON or world team cup, if they ever have it again. Yeah. I'm mean, here in the States and they're over there. That's not that's not helping me help them. Mm. So I could do more personal coaching that way. And I think I could be a help for an English club. Mm. One that would get me over there yeah. to help the Americans, but also to help an English club. I, I even watch, I've been over there watching some of the, 
the teams. Mm. When I go over there, I always spend a, a week in, in England, in the UK. And I just think that being a writer like Roscoe yeah. and, you know, a few others, he, he's the first one that comes to mind. I think, I don't think you can get a better team manager than an ex, a, an ex world-class writer. Yeah. I get doing a program and tacticals <laughs> and all that, but there's more to it. I, I would, uh, I think I would bring a lot of good things to a club as mm-hmm. far as, as having test days and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. And I don't know if they do that or not, or some clubs do, some clubs don't. Mm-hmm. I know that's one thing that, that Ty wanted with the British team, yep. which I think he's right on the money. Um, and I think that was one of his clauses. If they don't have that kind of stuff, he's not involved. Mm-hmm. Because there's more to it than just, than just showing up at the track yeah. and riding and racing. Yeah. So anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. But <laughs> but yes, uh, I'm interested. So yeah. if any promoters are, are interested. Well, if there's any promoters, managers, or anyone like that who are interested, give Lance a call. You know, he's, he's willing <laughs> to help. <laughs> um, I mean, I speak, I, I speak from... Um, I, from esports perspective, because I say it's my home club, I know them inside out and things like that. I know they have they've had test days in 2019 and things like that. Um, with, especially because they had um, the likes of Jason Edwards, who's a young English rider coming through when he was first signed into the championship. They gave him a lot of track time. Um, so obviously, because obviously he's jumped up from the national league up to the championship, and they gave him a lot of track time and seat time and things like that. Riding with the likes of Eddie Kennett, um, Richard Lawson, Louis Kerr, people like that. They're they're all top riders and things like that. So yeah, but. You know, I agree with you. But like the best referees and the best team managers are ex riders. You know, because they they are the people who know it inside out, and you're seeing it from both sides of the fence. I mean, um, I'm sure when you came over and did those uh, few meetings at Kent and Mildenhall a few years ago with the um, USA team, we had those three team tournament meetings. You know, that must have opened your eyes a little bit to sort of like how the uh, the program over here in England sort of works. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know. No. COVID. Oh. COVID's got to go away. Oh, yeah. Get rid of this COVID crap and then we'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> Start turning left again. Yeah, I have a feeling that I don't think it's going to go away. And I just think that we're just going to all, as a, as, as a world, figure out how to live life with it around yeah. rather yeah. than just – Rather than just shutting everything down, I'm not, I don't believe that that's the answer. Mm. But I do believe that, you know, like I'm going to throw like a little thing out here (laughs) that in Germany, and I don't know if this is true, so you'd be able to back me up. In Germany, they had a, an event with 25,000 people, Mm. uh, spectators in a well ventilated area, and they all wore masks. Yeah. And they, in their studies showed that that did not have a big uh, influence in Mm. COVID spiking and that if it's done properly, then, then we can go back to these kind of events. Yeah. And so if that's true and other countries, other people adopt that, then Mm. let's do it, you know? Right. Yeah. I think, I think I've done that in, I have heard of that one or something similar to that. And then, um, so they did, um, I think a couple of concerts in New Zealand um, and things like that. And they tested people who didn't go and people who did go um, again, well ventilated. Everyone sort of wore masks. I think it was, and nobody showed symptoms. So maybe, yeah, that could be the way forward. But um, again, that's all political sort of thing and, um, right. and, and stuff like that. But, I must say, Lance, it's been amazing talking to you tonight. You know, it's been one of the great, great ones we've had. I think so. I think it's the longest episode we've had on the show so far. Oh, but, uh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> so, I'm, a, I'm a chatty Cathy at times. It's fine. It's fine. I love to hear the stories. Love to hear your side. You know, stuff like that. You know, again, number one at something else. Number longest, longest person on the show so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for reaching out, and uh, and hopefully, I get to talk to you again and, and see you soon. 
Yeah, no worries, no worries, mate. But thanks, thanks for your time tonight, and it's a we'll see you soon. Right, I must do do a shout out to me, uh, YouTube channel, subscribe uh, to Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You know, check out all the episodes; they've been so great, so fun. It's not just Spear Rise we've been interviewing; we've been interviewing managers, and uh, we had Peter Oakes on the show, and people like that. So you know, it's not just all about the rides; we are getting different people on every time. But cheers, Lance. Thanks for tonight, mate. Excellent. Have a great night. Mm-hmm.